Welcome back to Giant Stadium here in East Rutherford, New Jersey, site of today's Yale-Princeton game. And as you can see here at Giant Stadium, a kind of a gray day. The lights are on and have been on actually since pre-game warm-ups. You see a look at Steve Toshis here in his 11th year as the head coach of the Princeton Tigers. It's their second and last home game of the year. The other was played at the College of New Jersey against Fordham this year. All of this brought about by the destruction of Palmer Stadium and the rebuilding of a new facility. Meantime, Jack Sidlecki here in his first season at 1-7 and seven overall with Yale. This is their second trip to an NFL stadium this year. As we told you, their only win of the year came at Soldier Field in Chicago as they knocked off Valparaiso. Final in that one was 34-14. Other than that this year, though, not much winning for Yale. And as we have seen, they have really been decimated by injuries. In fact, Billy, we were told before the game that 64 players on their roster this year at one day or another have had to take at least a minimum of one day away from practice or a game due to injury. You know what that does? It takes away any type of continuity on the practice field. They've had five career injuries that guys are out for the season, and that kind of doesn't allow you to get any type of cohesiveness inside of the ball. So today... They're really, I think that the fact that they're playing at Giant Stadium should help fire them up, and this could make their season if they do beat Princeton. Well, as you can see, Princeton wearing the home black jerseys. Haven't had a chance to do that much this year. Going to be kicking off, and for Yale, back deep to take it is Todd Tomich, a freshman defensive back. He is back there along with Chris Torito. And there is Greg Nortman, the sophomore place kicker. Only does the kickoff duties for the Princeton Tigers. As we said, the Conditions today are going to be on the chilly side. The wind, of course, at Giant Stadium is going to be swirling field side. We are ready to go for Princeton and Yale, the second oldest rivalry in college football now underway. And that is Tomich at the goal line. With a little bit of a wall in front of him. He'll get it out to the 17-yard line, and that's where Princeton will start out its first offensive set. Make that Yale's going to start out its first offensive set. Joe Wallen, the sophomore quarterback, the left-hander, getting the start here today. Missed last week with an injury, but... He's a guy who jumped in this year after having been a defensive back and also having been a kick returner where the new coaching staff said, you know what, I'd like a chance to play quarterback. They've given him that shot, and they've been impressed with what they've seen so far. The sophomore from Metter, Ohio. He'll work out of a first down situation on his own 17-yard line with an eye formation behind him, and Todd Scott is the deep back, as you can see in that eye. Princeton out of the standard 4-3. And the throw on first down is going to be complete for a gain of just about two. Derek Bentley, the fullback coming out of the backfield, with a pickup just across the 18 and near the 19-yard line. Bentley is the freshman fullback for this team, and he gets the start here today and among the rest of the Yale offensive starters. We told you about Todd Scott, the senior tailback out of Newton, Iowa. He is the guy who is going to man things at the tailback position. The flanker is Ken Marshner, also a basketball player on the Yale basketball team. The split end, Jake Borden. The tight end, Bill Sprouse. Ruben, Luongo, Montesano, Ryan, and Cullum make up the line left to right. On second down at eight. This is going to be a give, and really not a whole lot there as Todd Scott tries to push the pack forward, but only gets back to the line of scrimmage. Third down and long going to be coming up for Yale as they try to penetrate that Princeton defense, which has been strong this year. They play out of a 4-3 set with King, Welling, Ferrara, and Tucker up front. That is left to right. Totting, Salters, and Green, three stellar linebackers. And the defensive backfield has also been good. Leach, Wilson, Ludwig, and Demler. So now a third down situation, and Wallen looks as though he's in a passing situation. Only completed 41% of his passes this year. A little bit of a roll to the left to try to make something happen. And there's the throw downfield, incomplete. Ludwig was right there to make sure nothing was happening as he was looking downfield for Jake Borton. And Yale's going to be forced to punt. Great start for Princeton. Three downs and out. They forced him to punt. I thought the quarterback, Wallen, should have run the ball because he had a good blocker in front, and maybe he would have picked up more yardage. So on fourth down, Ludwig is going to go back deep to take the kick. He is the Princeton punt returner. And Mike Morosik, the Ivy League Rookie of the Week, the freshman from Haddonfield, New Jersey, going to be kicking it away off a bad snap. It's a line drive kick away back in Ludwig up to his own 40. Trying to come to the near side. If he can get around a corner, he can go for a while. It's the 50, and there he goes, down the sideline with just the punter to beat. Trying to break the tackle and all the way down to the Yale 12-yard line. Tom Ludwig took it from the right side of the field all the way back to the left, and Princeton's already knocking on the door. We always talk about special teams. Special teams can win or lose about two or three games in the course of the year. They've got great field position. This is where the offense can take over. I've always thought the first five minutes of a game are so important to setting the tone. Princeton's come out. They're ready to go. 
Now you take a look at Jackie Burnham, who came on in relief last week at Penn, right here on CN8, and threw 9 out of 20 for 166 yards to lead Princeton back. He's got a first down situation now on the 12-yard line with a pair of receivers split. And that offset eye formation behind him. Girado gets the first carry, follows a big hole inside the 10-yard line, and forward progress gets him down to the 8 for a 4-yard pickup on first down. But let's take you back to how Princeton got here, Billy. Well, as you look at the return, the ball was kicked very low, and anytime you do that, it, it doesn't allow your cover to get intact. He gets a good running start, he gets the wall set up, and anytime he kind of fake to the right and he goes back, he, he gets his set up and uses his good speed, and he, that's the reason he's got good field position is because of the, the, uh, the special teams. Now Morosic was the only guy who could stop him. Now a second down for Princeton, and once again it's Girado banging off tackle, and he's going to get taken down near the seven-yard line. Maybe got himself another yard, third down coming up. Princeton offense has Girado back there. He will get a lion's share of the carries here today. There you take a look at Jeff Hockenbrock, who made the tackle. Girado and Clifford are the running backs. Wendler and Crowley are the wide receivers, and Jason Glotzbach is the tight end. Across the offensive line, left to right, these guys have played together a lot. Bennett, Abdullah, Wilson, Herdman, and Lamberton. On third down, they got to get it just outside the two-yard line to move the sticks. Burnham's got a man in motion. Blitz is coming. And that is a great blitz, a fumble, and a recovery for Yale. The ball picked up off the turf by Adam Hernandez of the 15-yard line. And Billy, they decided to take a chance with the blitz. It paid off. I thought it's excellent to do. Anytime you get in the red zone, if you come at them like that, it sometimes makes the offense have to do different things. The thing about Yale, their front seven is their big part of the team. The reason they've had problems in the past is because they're secondary. Big play gets Yale a chance to get right back in this. Scott Bennett, Benton, the blitzing linebacker, makes the hit. And as the ball pops free, Hernandez right there to fall on it. So Princeton, a golden opportunity to start the game. And you can see right here it gets taken away as the blitz took away any possibility for a handoff. So now Wallen brings his team back out first down and 10. And Scott's going to get the first run, trying to get away from Griff King. But he's going to get thrown back inside the 10. Forward progress was stopped at the 12-yard line. So a loss of a couple, maybe three on the play, and a second down and long coming up for Yale. And that Prince defense is really getting penetration. Anytime the defensive line can get penetration across the line of scrimmage, it can stop a running play. Good job by the Princeton defense. Adam Hernandez, the man of the moment, at least right now, coming up with a big fumble recovery. Of course, with a kicker like Sirk, you know that if Princeton failed in the third down attempt, it was a chip shot field goal for an early lead. Now on second down, this is Wallen once again bringing him out. Straight eye formation behind him. Left-hander looking and throws incomplete. Borden was going straight up the seam, but Wallen's pass was behind him a good five yards and fell incomplete. He had no one open on the play, really, and the offensive line, you had to give them credit. They did a good job protecting him. He's had some trouble with injuries, and maybe that had something to do with that play, but if they cannot establish the line of scrimmage, it's going to be a long day. Well, his injury last week was to his throwing shoulder, his left shoulder. He comes back in again after junior Mike McClellan took over last week, and McClellan would be ready to go again this week if necessary. Steve Toshis wants his team to keep the defensive pressure turned up here. Now on third down and long. Looks like the blitz might be coming. It's going to be a hand and straight through is R.C. Kaufman getting it out to about the 18-yard line. It's going to be good for a pickup of six, but well short of the first down, and Yale's going to have to punt it away again. Now they need a better punt on this play, Scott, because last time he had no hang time. He didn't allow his, his uh, defenders to get down there to be able to cover it. He needs hang time on this punt to be able to at least get decent field position. Well, do remember, bad snap the first time he had to pick it up off the ground. Still inside his five-yard line as he gets rid of it to Ludwig, and that one is a better kick as far as hang time goes. Not a lot of distance. It takes a Yale bounce in the vicinity of midfield. And into Princeton territory, it's going to roll dead at the Tiger 47-yard line. Well, so far, that's been the guy who's been trying to keep Yale out of difficulty. Princeton's offense will get its second shot when we come back, scoreless here in the first. Statistics show that 40% of all kids who smoke marijuana live in the city. Guess where the other 60% live? Back to action now as Princeton brings it out first and 10 from their own 47-yard line. And burn on the turn and the hand to Kyle Brandt, who got his first action last week against Penn. Highly recruited player out of Illinois, and he got a gain of close to three yards on first down. 
This is going to be interesting on this drive because Yale's strong point is their front seven. They're trying to test out the left side of that, of that defensive line. But if they can establish the run, then they can beat them by throwing the ball because you're not going to run against this Yale defense unless you get something going. So now on second down, just shy of the midfield stripe, Burnham taking a look at it. He's a junior out of Washington, D.C. Once again, it is Brandt trying to spin off the right side. Scott Benton was in there late to make the tackle and up high. Down low is Jim Smith coming over from his left tackle position. And a third down now awaiting the Tigers. I like that front seven. I'm going to harp on them all day. You talk about Isaiah Wilson. He's a pro bowl I mean, he's a pro uh, athlete that has a chance to make the pros. And his quickness is really uh, uh, Princeton's going to have to deal with that all day. Quick huddle for the Tigers in a throwing situation now for Burnham. He comes out of the gun. Four receivers to choose from with Brant set up in that slot to the left. With a look at it, Burnham, lots of time. The fire and incomplete. Canole couldn't hang on to it. Would have been short of the first down anyway at the 44-yard line. And now, Prince is going to be forced to punt. Now, we told you both offenses have been struggling of late. A combined four touchdowns in the last three weeks for both teams. Now, Princeton's had good field position two times, Scott. They haven't been able to take advantage of it. That could come back to haunt them. Matt Evans, the junior kicker, kicking it away to Todd Tomich. And another line drive kick held up a little bit by the wind. He was angling, and he did get it out inside the 20-yard line and inside the 17. So for the third straight possession, Yell is going to be backed up inside their 20-yard line to start things out first and 10. This telecast of Princeton University football is sponsored in part by McCaffrey Supermarkets. McCaffrey's, when they say fresh baked, they mean fresh. Baked from scratch by their talented professional bakers and pastry chefs right in their stores. McCaffrey Supermarkets offers a wide variety of gourmet cakes, pastries, and breads. McCaffrey's, a supermarket experience in Princeton, West Windsor, and Yardley, Pennsylvania. Coming up and making the play defensively was David Ferreira. And he was helped out on the play by Jerry Wilson from the cornerback slot. Flag down on the play as well, and the preliminary call is going against Yale. So that gain is going to be taken away, as will the fine defensive play. And there you can see the injured Bulldog on the field, Derek Bentley, the freshman. So a couple of things to sort out here now as the officials are going to walk off this penalty against the Bulldogs. I'm interested to see what Yale does because Joe Wallen has good mobility. On that handoff just then, if he had a fake to handoff, he would have had the corner himself. We have holding, holding on white. After the penalty, we're going to repeat first down. So the penalty called by the officials, a 10-yard holding penalty. It's going to back him up. And they are now taking their own official time as Derek Bentley, the injured player who is on the field, is being attended to and looked at by the trainers. Bentley, as we said, a freshman out of Edmond, Oklahoma. Averages about four yards a carry. Jerome Miranda just made that call. Stephen Keller is the umpire today. Michael Allen, the head linesman. The line judge is Timothy Schmidt. No relation that we know of to the former member of the Eagles. And that, by the way, would be the rock band. <laughs> David Walker, the back judge. Gary Janis is the field judge. And there you can see Derek Bentley being taken off. Now, Scott, we got a first and 19. Anytime you get negative yardage and have to come first and long, it puts your offense in a big hole. Right now, they really got to come up with something because the offense hasn't done much. I like the rollout, trying to use uh, Joe Wall in some way, get him outside, utilize his athleticism. That's something that they did early on in the first drive, rolled him out a couple of times, both on fairly safe passes, or at least the primary receiver was running a fairly short route. First down and nearly 20. Once again, it is going to be Scott trying to get something. Working his way inside, he runs over the defense, finally dragged down from behind by Webster as he got it out to the 13-yard line for a pickup of five. I like Todd Scott as a running back. He's tough, he runs hard, he gives great effort. And I don't know if this is going to wear him out because he's a two-way player. And during the fourth quarter, we have to take a look if he's going to get tired or not. Princeton defensive unit. Last week, they really held Penn in check in the second half and came back from a 17-3 deficit. Here you can see them swarming a little bit, trying to get to Scott. Ludwig almost got run over, but Webster had hold from behind. So second down and long now. You would expect a throwing situation, but they're going straight up the gut with it to the fullback. And Conrad Sapilnikov will get it out to the 20-yard line. 
they are trying to establish the middle of this line. And if they can at least pick up a minimum of four yards, that's a good run for them because it comes up third and seven, which basically is a passing situation. If they can get the middle of the line going, it will allow the Princeton defense to come down and yell and get outside. And I think that's what they're trying to do. Jim Green, middle linebacker for this Princeton team, calls out the defensive signals. Right now, his team is looking to hold here on third and seven. No more than two receivers at any one time as Wallen goes back. Got a little time. Got it over the top, but it's incomplete. Green was set up pretty well in front. Damani Leach was behind the intended receiver, and they were trying to use the size of Ken Marshner, who's 6'6", to get that one in there for first down yardage. Linebacker Tim Green did an outstanding job of getting back in the pattern of the receiver. That's what a quarterback's got to look at, and he almost had an interception. If you look at the replay, Tim Green sees it, but the play action doesn't work because they weren't getting long yardage. He gets right in the pattern and really almost gets an interception. Barachik already with his third punt here in the first quarter. Ludwig fielding at his own 38. Brian right side now got a couple of blocks. Good special teams play, though. Stops him before he got ahead of steam going. Out at the 49-yard line. It's Tom Ludwig who made the tackle, and Princeton will come back out again. Here's a look at Marshner running that... Now he runs a good route, and he comes back to the quarterback. The thing about it is the linebacker gets in the way. If the, if the linebacker Green had not read it as well as he did, it would have been a completion. Once again, you wonder whether or not a linebacker being able to read a sophomore quarterback's eyes, he was pretty much locked in on Marshner all the way back. Good point, too. Steve Toshis, 11th season, looking for win number 69 here today. The team got a first down and 10 at their own 49. And Burnham... Gives it off to Brand, who's going to get to the 50-yard line and really no further than that. Trying to take it out over the left tackle and Justin Bennett's side, but the play never really materialized, and the tackle was made by Peter Mazza, the backup linebacker. With the quickness of that Yale Bulldog, Bulldog front seven, I keep going back to it because they are not going to allow them to run the ball. The only way to beat Yale is to be able to throw the ball. You see the flags out there. They're blowing pretty hard, and it makes it tough to throw into it. They've got to get something else going because the run is not there for Princeton. It was a pickup, but only a yard for Kyle Brandt, so second down and nine coming up. Split receivers once again for Burnham, but this time he's going out of the gun. No signs of blitz from Yale, and a long count from Burnham. A little bit of play action, and the throw is complete. Good yardage down inside the 40-yard line for Princeton, picked up by Ken Navarez. He makes the catch for a Princeton first down, first one we've seen. I thought it was a good, good, excellent job of play action because he was in the shotgun. He had a fake uh, handoff to the running back, which had the defensive line. Had to, if you watch the defensive line, they had to hold up a little bit because they thought it was a run. Then the receiver makes an outstanding job of coming back to the quarterback. First first down of the game for Princeton. Burnham showed good poise last week in the game against Penn. Stepped up and fired that one as he had Navarro's wide open. Now with a little bit of a roll on first down. A couple of receivers to choose from. That one is complete to Canole down the 25-yard line. A pickup of 13 yards, and once again, Burnham seems to be getting into a bit of a rhythm now as he had two receivers to choose from on that right side. It's an excellent job by the coaching staff because the run was not making it. If you get him outside, his receivers, the defensive backs for, for Yale are really not that good. That's the, the negative point for them. They, if they can do this all game, they got a chance to put this one away. Coming up on the six-minute mark here, left the first quarter, still scoreless. Second time now that... Princeton has been down inside the 25-yard line of Yale. First time they lost it on a fumble. It's going to be a straight give through the middle to Brandt as he angles off the left side and gets it down to the 22-yard line for a pickup of three. And this has been set up by the pass. Usually, you try to set the, use the play action by setting up the run, but because the run was not working, they went back to the pass, and now the running game can get into focus because the defensive line has to watch out for both of them. Look at the Princeton Tigers. They have certainly put some mileage on this year. Their final game of the year is a road game. Longest trip that they do as far as the Ivy League goes up to Dartmouth next weekend. And every year that there's been Ivy League football beginning in 1956, these two teams have met on the next to last weekend. It's as much tradition as you can get. On second and eighth, Blitz is coming. But I believe a delay call is coming against Princeton. They were too slow to get to the line. And second and eight is about to become second and 13. Ball, delay of game, delay of game on the offense. Now, once again, Steve Tosh is telling his young quarterback, John Burnham, well, we've got to move this a little bit. And that's what the, the result of the quarterback not paying attention to that because he's the one that, that dictates that. 
Well, Burnham, as we said, just trying to get involved and trying to get some rhythm going as he took over the starter's job midway through the last game. The second down now. Off the roll left. Got a receiver. He's going to elect to run it behind the block of Brandt. Got it inside the 25-yard line. It was hit from behind by Isaiah Wilson. And there you see the speed of Isaiah Wilson chasing the quarterback down from behind. Absolutely. And Wellington Mayer and both George Young are looking at him. He showed outstanding speed coming down the line. He, he gets off the block. And look how quick he is. Gets off the block and runs down the quarterback. That guy can play. And that's the kind of effort you need to keep the defense off. As you said, taken out by the block. And it would appear out of the play, but he just stayed right with it and made the tackle from behind, setting up a third down and long. Wilson, a senior out of Louisville, Kentucky. All Ivy player last year. Third down and nine. Burnham, a little trouble with the snap. Got a receiver wide open. And Brent got first down yardage. Down to the 11-yard line. And a double check on that. That was Bruce Herb coming out of the backfield, but good enough for first down yardage down to the 11 as he came clear with not a linebacker picking him up. The blitz was there. Burnham saw it and threw to the open receiver. And that's exactly how you beat the blitz. If you beat, if you can hit the open man and burn him one time, it'll make them just, uh, think twice about coming. As you look at Burnham, does an excellent job of getting the ball off. And the thing I like about it, it shows great effort. He puts his hand down and picks up the first down. Ben Blake, the free safety, tried to come up and help out. Now it's Brad. Getting his way down to the six-yard line for another five-yard pickup. Princeton seems to have the offensive motor humming now as they struggled in their first couple of possessions, but now they're moving the ball inside the ten-yard line. The first couple of times you have the ball, you're kind of feeling the other team out. Now I kind of seem that Princeton knows what they're doing. They're trying to play the entire field. They're running, they're passing, they're play action, and that's how you keep a defense off balance. With the front seven as good as Yale is, you've got to do different things. Yale's defense backed up against its end zone. And now there's the pitch to Brandt. Got a little bit of an escort out there, but can't quite beat the cornerback. Actually, it was Ben Blake who turned the play inside to make sure the hit could be made by Scott Benton inside the five-yard line. Nice job by Scott Benton, Benton uh, getting to the ball carry and taking him down. Uh, this is the tough territory. They've had, they had really trouble when they get inside the five, and right now uh, DL has really got to get penetration. If they can get across the line of scrimmage and get penetration, they can stop Princeton and maybe have to allow them to settle for a field goal. And now Burnham is called for a timeout. He wants to go over and make sure that this play is right with third down. They still can get a first down without scoring. He wants to go over and make sure they're calling for the right thing with a third down and about three yards to go. They've got to get it down near the one-yard line to get the first down. Of course, also could go for the end zone as well. When you talk about what the Tigers have done over the last three games, there's been at least one aspect of their offense that has been hurting. Against Harvard, they couldn't rush the ball. Against Columbia, they couldn't pass the ball. And against Penn last week, a paltry six yards total rushing. But to their credit, they're trying to utilize everything today. They come out with the play action. They're, they're trying to run the ball. They're trying to throw the ball on the run. And it's good when you do that because if something doesn't work, you don't knock your head, you try something else. This drive is a very good drive for Princeton. This could be the confidence that allows them to go on. Well, there you see Burnham, who missed his freshman year with a shoulder injury, came on this year, and with Harry Nikelny coming back after having missed a year, Nikelny took over the starting job, had a strong start to the year, then slumped a little bit, and he is bothered by a rib injury today. Burnham came on, played well in relief at Penn last week, and Burnham's the guy now, trying to get his team into the end zone with third down and three. Working out of the shotgun, three receivers to choose from. Yell with three down linemen coming. Here's the blitz. Burnham throws incomplete. He was looking for a Clifford, but Todd Scott, who's been playing a little bit of both today, was right there defensively. I thought it was a bad throw by Burnham, and he really kind of put the ball low. Didn't give the receiver a chance to, to catch the ball. Uh, this is fourth down. I was thinking they were going to go for it if they had got something like one or two yards to be able to make their fourth down short, but now they're going for the field goal. Here you take a look at it, and Burnham was forced to get rid of it quickly as he was trying to throw a quick pattern, but... Clifford was very well covered. Now it is Sirk who's going to be going from 21 yards away. He has been automatic this year. He was blocked last week against Penn, but otherwise has hit everything he has kicked all season long. Set up a little to the outside with a tight goal post, but he drills it through for the first points of the game. And with three minutes left in the first, Princeton is up 3 to nothing on that 21-yard field goal. This guy has a great leg. I look the way he kicked it, and even though the pro pro goal post are a lot thinner. He put it right through. Could have been good from being further out. Well, he is a guy this year who really has stepped in and done the job. And, and Princeton special teams, we emphasize that for you in our open. 
to tell you what a big factor they would be. Well, you saw them early on in the game getting the big punt return to give them a scoring opportunity. And the first score of the game comes via the special teams. And one of the things that they're looking at right now is the fact that Steve Tosh's team has to start getting into the end zone a lot more. They've got to cash in on opportunities like that. Yes, they do, because two times they've been down there, only come away with three points. But the good thing is that their special team's been pretty sound. Alex Cirque has been a big part of it. He's getting 15 out of 16 this year. Anytime you got that kind of automation, it makes your team have a little bit of confidence. But they need, as you said, at least come away with touchdowns. CNA Sports happy to be here at Giant Stadium. You're pretty familiar with this place, aren't you? Absolutely. Got my first one in the yard. Teeing it up and getting ready to kick it away is Greg Norton. As Princeton has taken the three to nothing lead. Dangerously near the sideline, but picked up by Torito. And now he's got a little bit of room if he can get by. Turning it back inside, and he gets swamped at a 25 yard line. And that's where it's going to be first and 10 now for Jackson Leckie's team. Coming in with one win on the year. They really have struggled. What's important for the Yale offense now is they have to establish something so the defense can get off the field. The defense is on the field a lot. If they continue to do this, the defense is going to be tired out at the end of the game. But Scott, this is their best field position of the game. So first down from the 26-yard line. And it is Joe Wallen coming out at quarterback. Wallen with a look and the throw, it's complete. He got it out to his tight end, Bill Sprouse, running the out pattern for the first Yale first down of the day. Going to be out at the 38-yard line. I love it when a quarterback passes on first down because the defense is sitting there waiting for the run. That's the, the way they expect it. He did an excellent job standing in the pocket. And as you watched him, he showed excellent poise in the pocket. He even looked to his left a little bit, came back to his right, threw a perfect pass to, to the uh, Sprouse and, 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 and first down, first first down of the game for Yo. Good touch getting it over the top two of the linebacker Jamie Toddings. Joe Wallman once again down under center with his team coming up with his first first down of the day. There's a run through the middle, not a whole lot there for R.C. Kaufman, and he was hit hard by Tim Green, who came up to fill the hole. I like this guy, Tim Green, already. He does an excellent job dropping into pass coverage. Excellent job of great, a great form tackle. A running back does not like to get hit like that because he wants to go forward. Didn't allow the running back any type of extra effort after he was hit. Nice job by Tim Green. Look at the form tackle, look at the hit. Put his head right exactly where he was, and, and that fires up a defense. And I guess you could say firsthand that no running back likes to get hit like that. I know for sure. <laughs> Dropping the shoulder down right into the chest as Tim Green continues to play strong, the co-captain of his Princeton team. On second down, this is Wallen looking. Nothing there downfield, so he tucks and runs, and he gets chased down from behind by Whaling across the 40-yard line and out to the 42. Maybe a pickup of about three yards on the play. And Scott, that's what you call a coverage sack. Uh, Whalen had had time to look over the entire defense. There was nobody open. He did a good job by, by, by tucking the ball away and picking up what he could. Well, he is just part of the whole backdrop here for first-year head coach Jack Dudlecki. And the young quarterback taking a look. Nothing there. Thought he might have some room. Good play by Whalen coming down the line of scrimmage to make the ankle tackle. So now a third down situation, calling third and seven. They've got to get it out across the 48-yard line. Blitz is coming. He's in a lot of trouble throwing the ball away. And it's incomplete. Flag down. And I believe we might have a grounding call coming on the quarterback, Joe Wallen. He just had to get rid of it as Tim Green was coming hard on a blitz. And it is indeed going to be intentional grounding. I can't fault the quarterback on that because he didn't want to take the sack. you got to give him something for his intellect on that. But the thing about it, he's got to throw it to a world receiver's at least close by. As you look at Tim Green, he's doing everything in this game. He's forcing him to throw the ball before he wants to. You saw three Princeton players there. There was nowhere Walling could go. This is what he's looking at, trying to come free. And he threw it out into the flat. Unfortunately for him, not a receiver there to be had. He's got to talk to his blockers because nobody blocked anybody. There were three defenders in there, and that's just tough on a quarterback. Saw a little bit of a stunt there from Green as he came around on that blitz. Started out in the middle and then came around the defensive end. So with a minute 13 left here in the quarter, Borachek once again punting his fourth punt of the quarter. Ludwig calling fair catch and makes it at the Princeton 46-yard line. Three-nothing Tigers on top with 105 to play. Morocic, as we said, the Ivy League Rookie of the Week, one of the nation's leaders in putting the ball inside the 20-yard line. He's done it 15 times this year, but not really simple to do that when you're punting from your own 10. 
know, despite Yale being one in seven, their defensive front seven has done a good job, but you get worn out if you continue to stay on the field this long. They've got to come up with a big play because uh, Princeton's got great field position again. Steve Dosh's team coming off a field goal in its last trip down the field. Burnham leading him out first and ten. Blake is coming. Burnham falls down, and he is called down at the 42-yard line. Looked as though he may have gotten caught up with his center, Brian Wilson, as he was trying to come out after taking the snap. You got to make sure you get the ball for it first. When the quarterback sometimes comes out too soon, it's because he is not having his concentration uh, the way it should be. That is a negative play when you're in good field position. That hurts. You got to come up with second and long. That's a bad situation. Coaches don't like that. As you look at it, he gets under his center, and, and I think that, that that just makes him tripping in college ball. You're down when you hit the ground. So on second down now. Check, by the way, his center is Bernie Marsick, who's jumped back into the starting spot today. Burnham with a little bit of a pump fake. Looking downfield, got a receiver if he can let it go, but he can, and he's chased out of bounds and knocked out by Jeff Hockenbrock. Good play by the defender to come back up and knock him out at the 35-yard line. That is going to be an 8-yard loss on second down. See, I don't like that play because the quarterback has a chance to throw it out of bounds. He's right there on the sideline. You don't want to come up with that type of negativity. Now it's third and long. The defense has the advantage. And this one, you can allow that yank, that Yale Bulldog front seven to come at you. Coach said, lucky taking over for a legend in Carm Coza this year. It's been a struggle. At the end of the first quarter, with one down and three to go, though, Yale hanging around. And they trail Princeton by a score of 3-0 here at Giant Stadium in the Meadowlands. We'll be back with second quarter action in just a moment. Early day for football. Ball. It is the month of November. We should be getting a little bit more in the way of days like this. 3-0 Princeton lead here as they're going to face a third down and long in the first play of the second quarter. This is a big play for Yale. If Yale wants to get back in the game, they need to stop them right here. They cannot allow them any type of, of positive action. Burnham is the quarterback. Moves Clifford behind him in the standard I formation. Got three receivers to choose from and going straight back. Big rush coming, setting up the screen, and he bounced it up to Gerardo. Burnham was just moments away from getting pounded on the play. Jim Smith was coming clear and knocked him down inside the 20. But the thing about that play, if he had a, got the screen off, he had a blocker in front of him, and they had some, some, some room to work on that. So now will be Burnham going back to the sidelines. His team sputters a little bit offensively. And here you take a look at it. They were setting it up for the screen, but nobody got Smith. And now the punt knocked back deep. A little bit of room now. And out inside the... 35-yard line out to about the 39-yard line with the return was Todd Tomich. So pretty good field position for Yale to start things out now, first down and 10. This is the best field position of the day so far. Now, you know that we told you about Princeton's offensive struggles. Yale has had theirs as well. Just 29 yards passed a couple weeks ago against Penn and against Cornell last week, just 39 yards on the ground. We told you about these teams have either had it work in one way or another, but there's been one department offensively that's been sorely lacking for each of these teams in the last three weeks. As we told you, each with just two offensive touchdowns in the last three. On first down, Wallet, lots of time, throwing it deep, got a man, completed to Princeton territory. Down at the 28-yard line is Jake Borden running a post pattern. Great field position for Yale and a nice throw for Wallet post. Excellent job flash and goes straight back. Waller runs a simple seam pattern. He's a big tall guy, 6'4", 190, gets his body in front and makes the biggest completion of the day. And, and Yale has something going. Look at he goes straight back with the play action. Uh, Borden comes right down the middle. He's their leading receiver, uses his body, goes right in front of the defender. Big play for Yale. Borden's 18th catch of the year, and it comes just on that simple post pattern, getting inside Damani Leach. So now Yale goes back to work on first down in Princeton territory. No gain on first. On the handoff to Todd Scott, the tackle made by Tim Green. You know, as I said over and over, Scott, I love when the offense comes out and passes on first down. because The defense is not ready. They came back on their first down after they got the first down and ran the ball, and that's when you run into the teeth of this Princeton defense. Wallen coming back out again. Two-time All-State player in high school, and he did it all. We told you about that. A quarterback, wide receiver, kicker, kick returner, the whole nine yards. Left-hander looking on second down with the roll. Got a little bit of time and throws it away, and that was wise because 
to try to throw to any of his receivers, he would have had to have stopped it, thrown back across his body, laid across the middle is what they tell you not to do, and that's what he would have had to have done to try to complete the pass. Let's take you down to the field now to Jason Barr. All right, thanks very much, Scott. I'm here with the general manager of Comcast, Pat Scalen. Today's a big day here at CNA because we're unveiling a brand new truck outside. And what, what does that truck enable Comcast to do in terms of bringing the game to viewers? Jason, it's great for Comcast and we think for our cable customers because it's a new 45 foot production truck that NEP, one of the premier truck building companies in the country, has built for us. It's going to allow us to show you uh, better angles, uh, sound better, as uh, I'm sure Scott wants to describe this play here. Pat. Yeah, there you go. And, uh, it's it is uh, it's, and it's a out. tremendous opportunity for us to uh, go out into venues like Giant Stadium and the major arenas around New Jersey and the Philadelphia area and do first-class productions uh, for our customers. And it's also just in time for basketball season. I know you got a full schedule of the hoops heaven with you coming up. That's right. We've got about 45, 50 games coming up, live college basketball. And it's great for our employees, too, because I don't want to say our old truck was a little small, but we had to hand out breath mitts when you went into the truck. <laughs> a little close quarters, but it should be great for John Anderson and the crew, and we're looking forward to using it the rest of the year. And one of those college basketball teams, Princeton, already 2-0. Let's go back up to Scott and B.T. Flag of the play as Barachik tries a 43-yard field goal. He hooked it a little bit left, and it's no good. Now the question is, what's the flag that's down on the field? If it were offsides, Yale would get another crack at it. If it were procedure on Yale, more than likely Princeton would say no. And that's going to be the call, procedure against the Bulldogs. So Princeton will obviously refuse the penalty. And they're going to get good field position for Steve Toshis on the missed field goal. Timeout on the field. Princeton going to take over again offensively as Burnham comes out and tries to lead them to something. Early second quarter action, and it's the Tigers leading it by three. If you smoke pot one time, it probably won't kill you. But if you keep smoking it, you might just get dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber. 13-19 left first half, and... Princeton on a 21-yard field goal by Alex Sirk has a 3-0 lead. On first down, another flag down on the play, and Burnham tries a quarterback sneak. Not a whole lot there as he got it out to the 27-yard line. Maybe a gain of about a yard, but we'll have to see about the flag. That play didn't look good from the very beginning. Think about the last series for Yale. Even though they came away missing a field goal, that's got to give them confidence because they made some positive yardage and they kept their defense off the field. If they can do that, they have a chance in this game. They're only down 3 nothing, and every time that the clock goes on and they're, they're only down 3 nothing, that gives them more confidence and they're in this game. The five-yard penalty coming against the Bulldogs for setting up offside. So a first down and five now as Princeton comes back out offensively. Clifford and Brandt are the two running backs in that I formation. And on first down from the 31, a little bit of a roll. Burnham's got a little time. Throw an incomplete right through the hands of his intended receiver. He was looking for Canole out around the 40-yard line, and the pass just sailed a little bit. Canole could not come down with it. That's hard for a quarterback to throw the opposite way he's going. Even though it, they say it's a holding ball against Princeton, it's hard to throw a pass the way that his body was going. The ball was a little high. So to buy that little bit of extra time for Burnham, Princeton line caught holding. And we've now seen penalty flags on three successive plays after we hadn't seen too many of them in the holding, first quarter. Holding on Princeton, 10 yards from the flag, it's still first down. I would be scared, really, when you have second and first and long against the front seven of Yale because they've got such outstanding quickness on the front seven led by Isaiah Wilson and Tim Smith. It, it puts them in a, in a good position. Now the offense of Princeton has got to come up with something new. They've done a good job of spreading the field so far, but right now the defense of Yale is at the advantage. Over on the sideline, you saw Phil Wendler, the junior wide receiver, bringing the play in. When you're a coach, you don't look at too many terrific options when you got first and 22. No, you don't. Three plays, try to go a little bit at a time. And on that first play, Brandt going to try to get around the outside. Can't get away from Scott Benton. Junior linebacker has been playing big time here in the first quarter plus in this game today. He's come up with another hit. That was a nice play by him because it was a kind of a delayed draw play. He was able to get across the line of scrimmage and, and pick up and allow him to get the running back in the backfield. If, if the running back was able to get past him, I thought he had positive yards. But Scott Benton, you got to give him credit. He did a good job. As you look at the replay, he read the play perfectly, showed good speed, uh, really came across, did an excellent job of not allowing the running back to get positive yardage. Well, it's easy for him to make that kind of a read. He was a star running back himself in high school, so he kind of knows how a running back's going to think. 
Burnham's got a big rush coming, trying to get away from it, and he won't do it. Great rush by Hockenbrock. We've called his number a couple of times here in the first half, and the sophomore comes up with a sack. Anytime you have second and long and third and long, the defense is at the advantage. I keep harping on this Bulldog front seven. They are quick, and I, they're showing their quickness in situations. If they get to lay their ears back and they know that it's a passing situation, it's, it's, it's going to be hard for the offense of Princeton to do anything against them. Tenacious rush coming from Hockenbrock. And he was not going to let Burnham get away. Hockenbrock, a sophomore out of Bear, Delaware, played for a super program down there in Delaware. William Penn, they were the number one team in the state of Delaware when he was a senior. I look for a draw right here, Scott, some type of draw, because if you throw, you're in a tough situation. But he's going to back and try to get a nice screen pass. Draw, screen, pretty much same thing as they try to set it up, and Clifford's got some room. If he gets inside the block, he gets it all the way out across the 30-yard line. And out to the 34, he's going to end up a couple of yards shy of the first down, but a big 22-yard pickup on third down. And what that did was it bought a lot of room for the punter. Absolutely, and it was a great call by Princeton because you wanted to do something to get room for the punter. They got out in good field position. Now when they punt the ball, they have a chance to pin Yale way back there. How about this one? Princeton, not showing a lot of respect for Yale's offense, is going to go for this on fourth down after that big play to Clifford. Well, they're excellent against the run, so the front seven is going to be tested right now. Big fourth down play. Yale trying to come up big and hold, or are they just going to try to count them off sides? Did they get him? Flag down the play. A quarterback sneak is not going to get any yardage, but the idea there was for Burnham to use a hard count to try to draw the defensive line off. They all jumped as one. Now the question is, did Yale jump? If they did, they just handed Princeton a first down. Great job by Princeton. Great job by using the snap count. Yep, that's exactly what happened. Burnham used a hard count. And all five men on the Yale defensive line jumped. As soon as Bernie Marsick saw that, he snapped the ball. When you have a quick defensive line like the front seven of Yale, you know that they're going to go with the first audible the quarterback tries to do. He did a hard snap count. He used his head, kind of bounced a little bit, and picked up the first down. Good job by Burnham. And a good job by Marsick as well. The center is taught in that situation. As soon as you see the movement, do it. And of course, Coach Sidlecki doesn't quite agree. He says that, you know, maybe the quarterback center are moving a little bit there, and they drew his team offside. Big play for Coach Tashis and Princeton as they keep it going out to 39. Burnham, a little bit of a flare out to Clifford, but Scott is right there to meet him at the 40-yard line after a gain of maybe a yard. The thing about this is that they picked up a, a first down when they were, like, third and forever. Great job by Princeton, but then what this does is tires out the Yale defensive line. Because of their quickness and playing every down, their offense is not doing that good because they're making them uh, having to stay on the field too long. The, the Yale defense will be tired if they continue this. Burnham was just had a little bit of a pass, but Scott was locked in on Clifford right from the get-go. And a second down now coming up for Princeton. Second and a long eight. Once again, Princeton seems to be working better out of the shotgun, and Burnham's going that way again. Deep down the field, and that's a great catch made by Wendler. Phil Wendler extending his frame for first down yardage at the Yale 47-yard line, and he had to go up the ladder to get that one as it sailed. I thought it was a great catch by him. He showed his hands. I love when a receiver catches the ball in his hands. As Burnham goes straight back, he was the man covered to put the ball right up. He goes up in his hands and gets the ball, and that's his, uh, the, what a good receiver is supposed to do is catch the ball in his hands. Not a whole lot there that the defensive back Tomich could do. First down again, and Brand is going to be stopped at the line of scrimmage. Not a whole lot of room there as Peter Mazza once again came up from the linebacker spot and filled the hole. I think that Princeton is just running now just to keep them honest because right now the only positive things they're getting is when they either throw a, draw, a screen or throw the ball downfield because this front seven is not allowing them to run the ball. Steve Toshis, winner of three Ivy titles in the last seven years. He was the Division I AA Coach of the Year in 1989. He's got a team that's not playing for Ivy League title consideration this year, but they are still trying to play for the winning season. Second and nine. Once again, Burnham working out of the gun. Big blitz coming. It's picked up. He should have someone. Floating it down the sideline. Receiver there. Underthrown and incomplete. Coming back and trying to make the catch was Wendler as the ball was thrown just a little bit short and he tried to go through Tomich to do it. Now he's trying to buy himself a pass interference ball that he's not going to get. But he has something to yell about because the defender never looked back for the ball. They call that face guarding if you don't look back with the, with the offensive player. And I think that the ball was underthrown so that maybe that had something to do with it. But I like this receiver, Swindler. I think he's a 6'3", 185, got good speed, good hands. I like those tall receivers. 
Well, he's the tallest receiver they've had hit Princeton in a while. They don't specialize in tall receivers. Even all 6'3 wasn't going to help them there. A third down situation. Got it down near the 36-yard line for the first. And Burnham, all kinds of time. Setting up camp back there. Flag down, holding call coming. And the pass incomplete as he went down the right sideline. But flag came right in the vicinity of holding, and I'm sure that's going to be the call. Preliminary call against Princeton is the hold. Usually when a quarterback leaves the pocket because of pressure, it's a holding penalty. They do not need that because it will be coming on a field goal position. Now it's going to take them even further back. Well, they've shown they can take care of those third down and ridiculously <laughs> longs, but you don't want to make a habit out of that. And there's a look at Steve Tosh's crowd here at Giant Stadium as you take a look at the holding call. Crowd here at Giant Stadium was just informed that up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the game, it's basically going to determine the Ivy League champion this year. Harvard is leading Penn at halftime, 20 to nothing. And there's the walk off of the penalty as they take it all the way back inside the 39 yard line. So this is going to be a tall order now for Burnham on third down. And Yale plays Harvard next week, and I know at Yale they want to win that game. That's the oldest rivalry in the history of college football. Now this one is going to go on forever on third down. <laughs> They got to get this all the way down to the 36 yard line. A little quick mental arithmetic tells me that we got a third down and it's like 25. Burnham setting up the screen, but too late. He looked back too late, and right there was Isaiah Wilson coming around the block for the sack. Isaiah Wilson cannot be blocked by one man. He's playing both the defensive end and kind of an up linebacker position. He comes from the quarterback's blind side. That's when a quarterback is really at his most vulnerable. And Isaiah Wilson shows you why this guy has a chance to be in the post. He went right around Justin Bennett. And so now another putting situation for Princeton. As you see, Tomich back deep to take the kick from Matt Evans. And the left-footed kicker gets a line drive away, blasted over Tomich's head. And look at the roll that he got. All the way down to the Yale 23, 24 yard line is where they'll spot it when we come back. 740 left here, first half of play. Princeton with a 3 0 lead. Want to taste of something make you feel good? Leave me alone. A little crack won't hurt you. I said no, man. Good job, son. That's just what you do if that ever happens. Hey, Dad. Second quarter action with Princeton on top of Yale, three to nothing. It was a 21-yard field goal by Alex Cirk that first quarter. That defense was on the field a long time, Scott. Yeah, when we see time of possession at halftime, it is going to heavily favor Princeton. Now Joe Walland, who's just trying to get his sea likes to the quarterback of this team, hands off on first down for a short pickup, maybe a gain of two, right into the line. Yale has not shown the ability to get downfield much, although they did have one very big pass play to Jake Borden and set him up at Princeton territory. They came away with a missed field goal. As look on the sideline, the, the Yale defense is sitting down on the bench. Those guys are tired. The offense has got to sustain some type of drive to keep the defense and allow them to get some type of rest. Gordon is coming near side with Marshner now. As your two receivers split to the bottom of your screen on second down. That's Wallen on the roll. Try to avoid any rush. He's left-handed, remember. Throws, and it is incomplete. Jake Gordon tried to do the tightrope back at the 37-yard line, but he couldn't quite get his foot down. Remember, in college, it's just one foot, but he was already out of bounds and tried to reach back with his foot to stay in. As you look at uh, uh, Waylon on the rollout, he does an excellent job of getting his feet set and, and throwing the ball. He puts the ball just a little bit outside, but then Jake Gordon, who is 6'4", can't get that one foot in. Nice effort, though. you got to give him credit for the effort. Almost. Not he was point. trying. Yes, he was. His whole body was already out of bounds, and just to get your foot back in, that's, that's quite an act to do in midair. Yes, he did, but he did a good job of trying, and I think the effort was there. Just didn't get it done. The thing about it is they needed that because this is a third and long, and this is another situation that uh, Yale's got to come up with. Ball coming off as the Yale calls for another timeout. That's going to be their first of the half. Princeton has also taken one as well, so each team does have two timeouts remaining here in the first half. That was a wise tie out when you think about it for Yale because the defense has been on the field so long. It gives them a chance to rest and discuss what they can do on the third down. They've been rolling them out a little bit to the left. State playoffs are coming to CN8. Once again, CN8, the exclusive television home of the NJSIAA state championships. Boys and girls soccer, girls field hockey, and of course, the football titles as well. All starts on Wednesday at 8 with a boys soccer parochial final. So stay with us on CN8 and see which high schools will wear the New Jersey championship crowns. 
Always an exciting time of the year for the New Jersey high schools. Actually, an exciting time of the year in general. This is always a, always a good time. Football is uh, coming down to in college. You're talking bowl consideration. You're winding up for playoff time in the NFL. And college basketball was already starting up. Good, good crossover time. This is probably the most funnest time of the year, except March Madness. March Madness is great. Actually, I'm kind of partial to October where there's still baseball playoffs, but I might be alone in that opinion. <laughs> Third down now. Yale's got to get it out to the 34-yard line. And a problem as they tried to get the snap off. Really no place to go with it. And now that guy, who made the trip down from New Haven, you got to be liking the way he looks. Well, he, uh, his purple face, his white, his, uh, his blue face, Yeah, that, that's got to be difficult. Once again, the benefits of an Ivy League education on display. <laughs> So now punting time with 631 left here in the half is Bracic punts for the fifth time today. Line drive gives Lillard a lot of time to pick a spot. Had a big return in the first quarter. Oh, huge block made on special teams as Ludwig scampered out at the 42-yard line. But how about the Princeton block that was thrown by Chuck Hastings? the backup linebacker to help spring his teammate. You know, sometimes, Scott, the average fan doesn't realize how important special teams are. But another thing, they're the most dangerous part of the game, and that's part that I tried to avoid when I played even for the Giants. <laughs> I was lucky I didn't have to play any special teams except for the kickoff team. Well, you can obviously see here, first of all, a little bit of contact as the defensive unit, the, uh, the blockers, try to hold off the Princeton special teams. And down at the other end, a crushing block thrown by Hastings. First down and 10 Tigers from their 42. Blitz coming. And Burnham trying to bootleg. Really didn't fool anybody, but stays on his feet. Does the tightrope back and gets it inside midfield and into Yale territory at the 49-yard line for a pickup of nine yards on first down. I thought that was a good play on first down, too, because they had been running the ball a lot on first down. This time they chose to roll out. Burnham and did a good job of, of, of standing the sideline. And, and, and even though he broke a tackle, he showed that really that, that, that he's going to be a factor in the game. Burnham has, has done a good job since he's been in there and, and, and second and, and, and short right now. A lot of options available to him now. Off the successful bootleg on first down, but they're going to stay pretty conservative. Right through the middle. There's not going to be anything there. Let's take it down on the field as we're going to have third down coming up. We'll check in again with Jason Barr. All right, thanks very much, Scott. I'm here with Governor Pertacki, New York Governor. Thanks so much for uh, for joining us. Yeah, a little bit of a defensive battle. Uh, Yale's defense is playing great. They play great all year. It's the offense that uh, always puts them in a the hole, it seems. Yeah, you're Yale grad, 67. The first daughter went to the West Coast to Stanford, but your daughter stayed right here. She's a Yale freshman. That'll make you happy as a parent. Uh, I'm very happy she's there. It's a great, great school. I just wish the football was as good as it was when I was there. They're working on it. I have confidence in the coach, though. All right, enjoy the game. Thanks for a minute. Thank you very much. All righty, back upstairs. And a dive play for Princeton on third down at short. Going to be good for first down yardage as they gave the ball to Nathan McLaughlin. And he's got first down yardage. Princeton moves the sticks. More importantly, they keep the time moving. They have dominated time of possession. And they keep the Yale defensive unit on the field even further. That's exactly right. And, and Princeton's got to do something with this drive because they've only got three points. If they come up with just three points at the half, it's going to be trouble. First down once again in a defensive battle, as Jason put it, with Governor Pataki. McLaughlin, gain of about a yard, yard and a half down to the 45-yard line as he tried the right side that time. So this Yale defense, you have to take your hats off to them. They've been on the field all game. They, they do not allow Princeton to run the ball. That front seven is really tough. But the thing what Princeton has to do, if they don't come with points, what I mean by they're going to be in trouble is if they go in with 3 nothing, only a 3 nothing lead, that's a moral victory for Yale. So second down now. And there's a look you can see there. In the nice warm area are the coordinators, the assistant coaches for Yale. 420 and counting left in the half as McLaughlin once again gets the hand. This time absolutely nothing. And that was a one-man show along the line doing the stopping there for Jim Smith. Check that. Make that Scott Benton who made the tackle. And once again, strong effort from Benton here in the first half. And what happens is when the defensive line gets penetration across the line of scrimmage, as you look at the replay, look at the defensive line come up at the point of attack. They really just attack them. Excellent form tackle by Scott Benton. These guys are real. If they had an offense, they'd have a pretty good team. 
And once again, they've got a little bit of time to develop. The question is, defensively, among those guys that you're talking about with the front seven, five of them are seniors. Blitz coming on third down. Burnham trying to find some room to escape, and he's not going to get away this time. Hockenbrock got him back inside the 45-yard line. And Princeton is going to be back up to their own 44 to punt it away with three and a half left in the first half. As you look at Burnham, he doesn't have a chance to really look down the field. The coverage by Yale is very good, but when he retreats is when he gets in trouble, and that's when Yale is at the, because they're a quicker team. That's when they take advantage. And they didn't allow him any escape route that time. He didn't get the chance to roll away. They contained him. Evans, good kick. Belted it, and Tomich comes down with it. Avoids the first tackle. He's got five guys to get away from, though, and he's not getting away from Devontae Leach back at the 15-yard line. Great. So at the 15-yard line with 3.01 left here in the first half, Yale is going to take over. Hey, college basketball fans, your time is coming. CN8's 49-game Hoops Heaven college basketball coverage begins on November 25th when Monmouth travels to Princeton. Tigers already have big wins over Texas and North Carolina State right across the street here at the Meadowlands this week. Are the Hawks next? Find out when Hoops Heaven returns on November 25th. Offense of Yale has got to do something now. This poor defense of Yale has been on the field all day. Those guys are tired. There's 301 left in the half, and they would love to see if they can generate some offense, trailing just by three. It is through the middle. And pounding his way out to the 20-yard line for a pickup of four yards. Because I believe Derek Bentley back in the game. No, check that. It was R.C. Kaufman. And the good thing about Kaufman on that play, he ran hard. And that's the longest play from scrimmage that they have run on first down. If they can pick up four or five yards on first down, it makes it easier for the quarterback. And now they have a little bit of room to operate, but they got to keep that defense off the field. they got to come up with something right now. Clock continuing to move. Two and a half left for his staff in a second down situation. Once again, it is Wallen back to work. A little bit of a roll. Got some time this time. And the throw is going to be complete. Found Ken Marshner. Out of the 29-yard line, good for first down yardage on a little out pattern. Once again, that rolling pop pocket gave Wallen a little time to work. Excellent job of play action. And what Wallen does, he comes out, he, get, he looks at the biggest target in the field. A kid, Marshner, 6'6", gets on the sideline, picks up a first down. That's what they should be doing. Marshner, as we told you a little bit earlier, also a member of the basketball team for Yale. One of those rare players. They haven't had too many of those in their history who've played both sports. Got out of bounds. That stopped the clock with 2.17 left in the half. Remember, Yale does have two timeouts left. They're going to stick to the ground now as they try to get something done. And R.C. Kaufman didn't have a whole lot of room to operate. Good play by Jerry Wilson coming up from the corner to make the stop. That was a good tackle because I thought his momentum was going forward and he was getting ready to get at least four or five yards. Now this comes out like a second and about seven. And that's still a situation where the de defense has the advantage. I look for him to come back with that rollout again, Scott, because that's been successful if he throws it on timing. Nice tackle, boy. I like that kind of tackle. You got to be tough. This would be small, a small defensive back to come up and take the legs out from the running back. Jerry Wilson, who sat out last season with Mono, coming back this year and playing strong. And a second down now. Yells letting the clock move. Wallen got time. Now steps up. He'll use the pocket and run straight up the gut. 40-yard line and making like a running back. He's got first down yardage before being brought down by Green at the 42. They'll stop the clock now to move the chains with 127 left in the half. The quarterback has only an instant to make a decision. He goes back, he only has one receiver on that side. He sees he's not open, tucks the ball, gets positive yardage, and uses his quickness to pick up the first down. Nice job by uh, Joe Wallen. He was waiting for R.C. Kaufman's block as well. Kaufman springs there, shows him that he's there, but when that's not going to happen, Kaufman turns around and begins the blocking process. Keeps his quarterback from getting hit. They're not going to use their timeouts just yet. 107 left here in the half. And they want to buy their defense a little time, too. A little time to rest. Wallen throwing on first down over the top. Got a man. That is complete. And out of bounds of the 39-yard line of Princeton is Jake Gordon, his second big catch of the day. Nice job by Joe Wallen because he had been throwing to his right, to his left all day. This time he comes back to his right. He's got a big receiver, and Jake Gordon puts it up for him. He's wide. He Keeps his feet in and picks up another first down. This is their biggest penetration of the day. The second biggest penetration, excuse me. Both times with the throw to Borden that set that up. And he actually got both feet in over on that sideline. So now Yale has 50 seconds to work with and two timeouts. You see the numbers on Borden. He's 6'4", Marshner's 6'6". Six, six. A couple of big targets for Wallen. On first down. 
<laughs> Wallen again is rolling. Again looking and throws it behind his receiver, Kaufman. He had Kaufman open for a moment in the flat down around the 35-yard line, but threw the ball behind him. Yes, he does. And sometime in that situation, you need to have a little bit of touch on the ball because the running back is coming across the middle. All he needs is a little dump off. He had room to run in the front. Good call by uh, Yale Dolphin. That was a good move. This is a team that only averages 224 yards a game, 113 on the ground, 111 through the air, so they're pretty balanced, but they're balanced without getting a lot of yardage. 51 seconds left in the half now, and they've got a second down. Probably needed a good 15 yards before they'd be in field goal range. Wallen again, looking downfield, all kinds of time, it collapses, and so does he, back outside the 45-yard line. Strong rush from down low. And that was good for the sack as Whaling got him. And Whaling was just persistent with that rush as he dropped him for a loss of eight. Yes, he did. But he, he looked at his first receiver. He was not open, did not have time to tuck the ball and run. But the thing about it is it takes him really out. Now they got third and long, which is a tough situation. It's about third and 18. That's a tough situation for the Yale offense, which hasn't mounted much of a threat today. You saw the spin move there by Whaling as he got around the center, Joe Montesano. And I think Montesano expected that Wallen was going to step up into the pocket yep. that he was making. And when he didn't, Whaling had him dead to rights. And that's when their offensive line gets upset. Because if they, they're trying to create a pocket, if he can step up, he would have had room to throw. But really, he had nobody open. And I was looking for him to throw the ball or run it, to throw it away or run the ball. Mark Whaling. A lacrosse midfielder for the defending national champions at Princeton. They've done it twice now. Strong lacrosse program at Princeton. Strong basketball programs we've seen earlier this week in winning the Coaches versus Cancer Classic. A couple of other teams in New Jersey as well, Rutgers and Seton Hall. Other basketball fans can follow your team all season long on CNA The Comcast Network. Bruce Beck hosts Rutgers Basketball Weekly with new coach Kevin Bannon. And yours truly will be by with the Tommy Amaker Show with Seton Hall's new head man. All season long, Rutgers Basketball Weekly and the Tommy Amaker Show here on CNA. And now the officials blowing the whistle for time. After that Yale timeout, they are left with one. And this timeout is going to be called for and used by Princeton now. What's really interesting, Scott, is I told you the defense had come to the sideline and sat on the bench because they were so tired. Now the entire defense is on the sideline because they've got a little rest. If the offense can do that, they're in the game. Now, I said before, this could be a moral victory in the first half for Yale because they only held Princeton to three, down, three points. They are in this game, have a chance to win in the second half. That's got to be a worry for Steve Tosh's, and it's got to be a, a kind of a buoyant point, I guess you could say, for Yale as they come in here with just the one win on the year, but as outplayed as they have been and as much time as the defense has spent on the field, to be within three at this point and possibly within a big kick of a tie at halftime is a major moral victory. Exactly, and then if they create some type of positive things on offense, what that does is create confidence for them in the second half, and maybe by him rolling out to both his right and the left, they may have figured out something for the second half. It's all a game of adjustments. We'll make note of what they do in the second half to overcome this for the second half. Third down now coming up. Ball with 17 yards to go. Got to get it down just inside the 30. Look from the rollout again. You'd expect that would be the money play. Remember, they do have the one timeout left. Wallen, a little bit of time. Lofted it down the sideline, got the man, it's picked off. Leach just waited in the weeds down at the 25-yard line and sprung out as Jake Borden came down the sideline. The floater was there, Leach stepped in front for the pickoff. Now, Jake is a big receiver. I thought maybe if he had eyeballed the defensive back, he could have come across. Now, Waylon was just throwing the ball up for grabs, basically. And as you look at Jake, I thought if he comes across the defensive back, he's got a chance. But if that happens, he's got to turn to a defensive back and allow an interception. But still, they got a bad field position for, uh, for uh, Princeton. And with, with 34 seconds left, they got to keep him uh, out of the end zone. Damani Leach, the second leading interception man in Princeton history, beside, behind Superman himself, Dean Kane. 34 seconds now left in the half. Looks as though Princeton's going to be content to run it out as Jurado moves into the line and gets thrown back defensively for Yale. Play was made by Josh Phillips. There's a look at Phillips, a freshman out of Orlando, Florida. And Princeton seems content to run the clock out, but then again, Yale has got to feel good about what they've done so far. They can make some adjustments offensively. they got a chance to, to do something in the second half. And Burnham's got to be a little bit concerned. He's had pretty good field position, and yet Princeton has only come out with a 21-yard field goal. They're not going to get another opportunity as time ticks away to end the first half of play here at the Meadowlands. Now Princeton...
trying to move to 5-4, and four, guarantee themselves a 500 season. They would go for the winning season next week at Dartmouth. It is halftime here at Giant Stadium, and the 21-yard field goal is the difference as Princeton leads Jackson Leckie's team by a 3-0 score. We'll be back with more at halftime in a moment. This telecast of Princeton University football is sponsored in part by McCaffrey Supermarket. McCaffrey's, there is a difference. McCaffrey's supermarkets are committed to maintaining the highest standards in fresh meats and poultry. McCaffrey's uses only USDA inspected prime and choice meats, as well as certified Angus beef in all their stores. McCaffrey's, a supermarket experience in Princeton, West Windsor, and Yardley, Pennsylvania. Well, defense is ruling the roost here at Giant City at halftime with Princeton leading Yale by a 3 to nothing score. Let's take it down to the field now to Jason Barr, who's standing by with a special guest. Jason? Thanks very much, Scott. I'm here with Kevin Donovan, Princeton's Associate Athletic Director for Development. 3 nothing game. Not much of a excitement in terms of offensive, but anytime you get a lead, you got to be happy. Oh, absolutely. And plus, just to be in Giant Stadium for, for our kids who have been on the road all season has been great. So this is real special for them. Being here at the Meadowlands has been great. Your basketball team now 2-0. and Yeah, we're, we're doing pretty well so far. We're 2-0. We're, and we're, we're here today. Hopefully we'll get a win, and then we come back uh, in the Jimmy V Classic. We play Wake Forest, so maybe we'll end up 4-0 in the Meadowlands complex. One of the uh, new things this year at Princeton is the Varsity Club. If you talk a little bit about that, it's where Princeton alumni, faculty, friends can support the university. Right. Yes, the, uh, the Varsity Club, is, again, is a new program, and uh, it, we've opened it up to all letter winners, parents, even our senior athletes have free membership in, in the club, but it's a way to celebrate all 38 varsity teams that we have at Princeton, which is the second most in the country, and we really uh, uh, want to be able to honor those student athletes through this club, and we have coaches' luncheons, priority seating, uh, a lot of different benefits, and it's really been successful. We have almost 400 members in just a three-week period. All right, the band playing here at Princeton. I'm Jason Barr with Kevin Donovan. It's halftime. Tigers leading it 3 0. And also to uh, help support the uh, varsity club, I uh, know a woman's locker room and. Uh of course, the new stadium where the football is going to uh, football team is going to play, and to help fund that, you're selling some memorabilia, custom design from the old Palmer Stadium. We're going to take a look right now at one of the things you can buy. If you could tell us about that, sure. The, the pieces range from thirty dollars to two hundred and fifty. The two hundred and dollar and fifty piece, the one that you're seeing, is uh, a piece of the actual seat from the old stadium, uh, with a picture of uh, of uh, Palmer Stadium when we were playing Yale. As a matter of fact. Uh, with a full house of 40,000 people. So it's a real nice piece. Uh, again, they range from $30 up to 250 and all the proceeds from the sale of the memorabilia will go towards the construction uh, cost for the stadium. And how is that construction going? I know it's set for September, I believe. First game is going to be Princeton home against Cornell. How's uh, it going? It's going great. The lower bowl is just about complete. They started putting uh, the upper deck on, and we're on schedule for opening in fall of 98. All right, sounds good. Kevin Donovan, thank you very much. Back upstairs. Thank you. Well, obviously exciting things happening at Princeton, and one of the things you've got to go through is a year on the road. But when the locale is a place like the Meadowlands, well, it kind of gets everybody excited, including the band, as they perform here at halftime. Princeton defense is doing its job. The offense is going to try to get something done in the second half as they lead Yale by a 3-0 halftime score. Princeton trying to go to 5-4 and four on the year. We'll take a look at the halftime highlights, first half highlights, and the first half stats when we come back. The best cable channels can only be found in RCN's Family Value Package. RCN's Family Value Package is the complete cable package. Call 1-800-321-0544. Prince of the opportunity came from territory and used a little flare pass to set up the score. John Berman gets a good job of getting the ball off to Bruce Earp. Earp shows his athleticism. Running back is the best athlete in the team. Puts his hand down, picks up the first down. Nice play by Princeton. And Alex Seard, even though we've got NFL goalposts, is automatic from 21 yards, giving Princeton the 3-0 lead. He's got a perfect leg for the NFL, and I think he's a good place kicker. On this particular play, I thought uh, the quarterback does an outstanding job of getting the ball off. 
uh, and it uses his height and goes up over and makes the reception. Jake Borden set it up at a 43-yard field goal attempt then from Morocek. Hooks a little bit wide to the left, and that's really the difference of the game so far. One good field goal, one missed field goal as the windy conditions continue here at Giants Stadium. And we get ready for the second half of play. But as it stands right now, Yale trailing it by a 3 to nothing score, and they would love to be able to get some offensive production. That's Damani Leach is back deep to take the kick along with Grant. And there is Joe Wallen, the quarterback, warming up for when his turn comes after Yale's defense goes out on the field to begin the second half. And Scott, we got to make note of the adjustments that both teams try to make. Neither one has been able to mount any kind of offense threat. I think right now, Princeton, really, and they did a good job throwing the ball, but they couldn't run the ball. So they got to establish the line of scrimmage. If they can do that, they can get play action going. You saw Damon McLaren, who does the kickoff duty, and now he's going to have to go reset the ball, which was blown off the tee. That's a fairly common occurrence here at the Meadowlands. I've been a veteran of uh, seeing a lot of games in this place. I've seen a lot of balls blow off the tee around this time of year. Now you see the flag on the goalpost are beginning to move a little bit, and that may be a factor as the game goes on, because this game could come down to a field goal. Is there any truth to the rumor that the Giants actually open up those doors at the other end through the runway to make things tougher on the opposing team? I think when Parcells was there, he did it because the east wind, the wind blows a little bit stronger on that end, and that is a home field advantage. Hey, whatever advantage you can get, right? Leach back deep in his own two-yard line to start the second half. It's straight up the middle through the wedge. Flagged down to the play and a legal block call coming on Princeton as Leach spins out to the 25-yard line. But that is going to be coming back as the flag is going to go against Princeton. It was thrown back at the 19-yard line. If that's the case, they're going to be back inside their own 10 to start out the half. The officials conferring right now, and I believe the call is going to be a legal block. Yep. Blocking in the back. So you go half the distance to the goal line, and that means that the start is going to be inside the 10 for a team that manages 7 yards minus 7 yards on the ground in the first half, 75 yards through the air, both teams with 75 yards passing. You said keep an eye on time of possession. Princeton had a 5-minute advantage. And you think they'd have a bigger lead than this. Now the Yale defense comes on the field. they well rested. Princeton is backed up deep. This can set the tone of the game. Well, this is kind of how the game changed last week. We see Tosh is on the other end of it at Franklin Field. Coach said Leckie's team looking for a defensive stop now as Princeton starts at first and 10 at their own nine. They're going out of the gun, but it's going to be a hand to Gerardo. He found some room, lots of room through the middle. First down yardage. Ben Blake dragged him down from behind at the 25-yard line. And a big play for Princeton to get out of an early hole here on the first play of the second half. Excellent call because what they were doing is line up in a passing situation, throws a quick draw, he hits the hole running hard, ducks his and picks up positive yardage. That's the way to come out of the game. That could set the tone to set up the pass. Nate Boxrucker had a chance for him. And he just kind of slipped on through the arm tackle right there. It was only Ben Blake, the sophomore, who brought him down. Free safety, making the save and tackle. First down now from the 25-yard line. Princeton exclusively out of the gun, it would appear now. And once again, it's Gerardo. Once again, he gets room off the left side. This time out to the 29-yard line, just shy of it for a four-yard pickup. It always makes me laugh how coaches are creatures of habit. Anything that's successful, they'll come back to it. Oh, my goodness. Yep, that hurt. A little I bit of a hit. Here. I felt it up here, Scott. <laughs> ben Blake, the sophomore, dishing out a little bit of punishment. He's normally a finesse player. Got the best vertical jump on this team at 33 inches. On second down, a little play action for Burnham. Right side all the way, and the completion of Canole for the first down. Dancing out of bounds, just past the 40-yard line, and that's just a simple out pattern off a simple rollout. And I think maybe the call for Princeton here in the second half is keep it simple and not to try to do too much. I like that play because the first play, they picked up four yards. Anytime you get four yards on first down, it sets up your second down. Now, this play, he made an excellent job coming back to the quarterback. That's the way you play football. Good adjustment by Princeton. Once again, the simple roll bought Burnham a little bit of time, and the receiver wide open. Canole, probably the most reliable receiver among this court. Once again, the give is through the middle, and once again, the runner is Gerardo as he gets it out across the 44-yard line. And it's going to be a pickup of three yards on first down. you got a second down coming up. Now, what is that? It's something to keep all his hair warm. Is that what it is? I think so. Now, do you put individual hairs in each one of those things, or how does that work? I'm not sure. I think you've been heating pads in each one. <laughs> that designates everyone around them to be warm. Well, there's all kinds of tricks for keeping warm in this kind of weather, including battery-operated socks, which I tried one time and had to take off in the middle of the game because they were actually burning my feet. 
Second down to the low snap. Again, it's Gerardo left. And this time, Yale has made the adjustment after a gain of a little bit more than a yard. The third down now coming up. See, on the first down, they gained four yards, which I like. Second down, I think they should do something else because then the defense kind of settles into it. It's coming up on third down. This is a key situation for Princeton. Yale has got to have a big stop. Coach Sidlecki, as we said, that rough thing of having to take over for a legend in Carm Koza, who retired at the end of last season. Steve Toshes, he actually got his job under odd circumstances as well. Ron Rogerson, the head coach at Princeton who brought him there, suddenly passed away one summer. Steve Tosh has took over the top job. He's now in his 11th season. He's doing a good job also. Third down and five now. Got to get it just across midfield to keep the drive going as Burnham once again will work out of the shotgun. I look for him to run that comeback right here. Across the middle, threw it behind the receiver trying to beat the blitz, and Gerardo couldn't make the catch. So Princeton is going to be forced to punt it away as John Burnham saw the rush coming and tried to deliver the ball, but delivered it behind the intended receiver. And Scott Benton did a good job from his linebacker position of putting pressure on him, enabling him to throw the ball behind him. So now Matt Evans comes back on. Tomich stands back at his own 25-yard line. His left-footed kicker will get rid of the ball at his own 35. A little bit of a twister. Tomich bear catch at the 28. And now Yale will get its first offensive look when we come back. Early second half action. And Yale has yet to get anything done offensively, but even though they've been dominated, they're still only down by a field goal. Statistics show that 40% of all kids who smoke marijuana live in a city. Guess where the other 60% live? Now there you got uh, fans of all ages, I guess you could say. Out to watch today's game, which is certainly a defensive struggle. On first down from the 28-yard line, Todd Scott straight up the gut to the 35. It's going to be a pickup of nearly seven yards in the first carry of the second half for Todd Scott. And I think by them rolling out at the end of the half, it may make Princeton think that they're going to do that in the second half, so they try to get back to the middle, make Princeton bring it down a little bit, and then try to get back outside. Uh, the Bulldogs have used a lot of running backs. Four different quarterbacks. Juan would have started four of the last five. Three of their top four rushers were lost to injuries, and Scott, who was a running back in 1995, jumps back over from the defensive side, back to the offensive side. He's going to get the carry again, but try to cut back, ran into Griff King and company. Off on that defensive right side for Princeton, no gain on the play. And the Yale defensive unit, which came up with a stop its last time out, readies itself again as the offensive unit looks a third down. When you come out of the I formation, you're looking to run off the guards. Uh, Griff did an excellent job of stuffing guard Griff King and not allowing him to get positive yards. It's a big, big play for Yale. If they can pick up a third and three, this can get their offense moving. You saw Wallen looking on the right wrist. That's where all the plays are written on that wristband. It's all the way up his elbow. He's off to the ink running all the way up his elbow. Third down now. A little bit of a rollout again. Trying to stay away from King. Wallen's throw is incomplete. He got it over the linebacker, but through the hands of Todd Scott, and it was a tough catch to try to make, a tough position to put your receiver in on the sideline. Absolutely. If you look at the rollout, he has the option to run or pass. But really, he didn't have room to run because the linebacker was there. There was no room to pass. He tried to use touch. They're punting again. So once again, Mike Barachek kicking it away to Ludwig. Ludwig had one very big return in the early moments of the game on the first punt. Princeton fumbled inside the 10-yard line of Yale. Now he's backed up to his own 19-yard line. Ludwig straight through the middle. Here's a big hole. Flag down on the play. Ludwig on the run, spinning away. One block to go. Back to the middle of the field. And he's going to get taken down inside the 15-yard line at the 13. But I think that's all coming back with a flag sitting on the 36-yard line. You talk about special teams. Teams being a big part of your game. It's one-third of the entire game. That could have been a big play. They're bringing it back, and they're going to start with negative position but that could have been a big play and could have been the difference of the game because the way the Yale offense is going if Princeton gets up at all by more than a touchdown they can really turn to conservative on them and let the game go and an illegal block call big call against the Tigers oh I think that maybe it might be a point the wrong way that might be a point the wrong way it's an illegal block against Princeton here's a look at it as Ludwig tried to take it 81 yards had a shot at it but the flag is already out of your picture and already been thrown. That's going to be so fun for the returner to come in untouched like that. That's a rarity. 
You know, he went straight through the middle of the field. It's a rarity unless you're playing the Philadelphia Eagles. Happens a lot to them. <laughs> That's exactly right. That was 73 yards he went on Monday night. There it is. In the left-hand side of your screen, you just saw it. The illegal block in the back. It was almost inconsequential, but enough to get it called. And here's a look at Mirajic just trying to get something done. Trying to stay with it and keep the play in front of him. But see, he did a good job of holding him up until his other uh, tacklers were able to come in. Nice job by the punter, because most punters don't have a clue about tackling. <laughs> and being inside the yellow. 15-yard line. Princeton is now back inside their own 15-yard line. Tough turn of events for Steve Toshes. Jackie Burnham leads his team out first and 10 from their own 13. What a turning play. Absolutely. At I formation is Clifford and Grant behind Burnham now on first down. And they slide once again into the offset eye. Little play action. Burnham rolling. Quick throw to the tight end. Lots back. And he gets it out to the 19-yard line for a pickup of six. As quick as that Yale front seven is, play action will fool them immediately because if they came out of the game, they were picking up four yards in the first down. As you look at it, it freezes the defense. He comes out, was able to do a good dump pass, and any time you get four or five yards in the first down, it makes your second down situations. The defense now has to sit back on the hills because they don't know what the offense can do. Todd nice, Tomich nice had to come up and make the hit. Nice job, guys. Nice job. Glad's back making the catch. He was a guy who was told he would never play again when he was in high school because he had a herniated disc in his neck. He has bounced back and made a fine career of it as one more year to go. There you see the injured player, that's Ben Blake, who is down for Yale, off on the far sideline. But you talk about the modern technology of sports medicine. People nowadays are coming back from anything. CN8 has a way to help you put your family first. It is Emmy-nominated Family Talk. Each Monday through Thursday, make that Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Make it a point to put your family first with Family Talk only on CN8, the Comcast Network. Apparently, Ben Blake is okay, coming off the field under his own power. And see, the lights really starting to take precedent here at Giants Stadium. We haven't seen the sun except for earlier this morning, and certainly not during the game today. On second down, Brandt, little cutback running. Taken down by Isaiah Wilson at the 25-yard line, but good enough for first down yardage and another six-yard pickup. Anytime they gain positive yardage on the ground, it opens up the entire offense. They can use the entire field now. And I look for Princeton. That they made that adjustment at halftime because they're trying to get make sure they establish the line of scrimmage. If they do that, that sets up anything offensively. Once again, Burnham juggling it a little bit on the snap. Just a good catch to get it and stay in rhythm to hand off to the running back. Once again, out of the gun. This is going to be Brandt. And this time, Brandt sees six white jerseys. He bounced out with some pretty decent second effort running before Peter Mazu brought it down after a gain of about a yard. But the quickness of that Yale defense comes into focus right there. You look at all the linebackers. They, are, they pursue the ball well. I like this guy, Scott Ben. Look at him. He finds the ball, goes and attacks the ball player, uh, and get, let the defense come in and, and do that, what they call game tackling. That's what defense is all about. There you take a look at Scott Benton. I like him. Basically a special teamer last year. As a junior now has stepped in. They only run two linebackers. He can cover a lot of ground. On second down, Burnham again with the hand. Brant will cut back again. Flag down on the play. A holding call coming against Princeton. As that yardage got out to the 28-yard line for a two-yard pickup. But it's going to be a hold. You know, we had the Tigers for negative seven yards rushing in the first half. That was a surprise because I thought they had handled them pretty well. And you see now why, because that Yale defensive line, that front seven is so quick that they don't allow many cutbacks. Or if the running back does not get a clear shot, he, he, it's hard for him to break tackles and gain extra yardage. So the call goes against the Tigers. Steve Toshes watches his team again. We're repeating second down. They were backed up. If you look at Coach Lucky on the side, they were backed up by the illegal block and a punt return that would have gotten them down to Yale's 13 and started this drive on their own 13-yard line. And now a holding call puts them back to their own 15. Eight holding calls. Grant, nowhere to go. You want to give credit, give it where it's due on that play. Jim Smith made penetration into the backfield and turned the runner inside. He got a little bit of help later on in the hit by Corwin Carruthers, but Jim Smith makes the play. There's Carruthers going on. Any time that the defensive line gets across the line of scrimmage, it makes the offense have to be at, at, at a standstill. And I think that's the key to stopping a running game if you can get penetration. I think the Yale defense did an excellent job yet led by Jim Smith. Come on, defense! On the sideline, they're exhorting the defense. 
Third and forever again. Yeah. I don't know how much more you can expect of this defensive unit. They've held Princeton to three. Got him backed up again. Big blitz. Both backers come in. And Burnham is put on his back by Benton. Big sack down to the five-yard line and just inside. And now Evans is going to be backed up into his own end zone to punt it away. As you look at the replay, Benton gets off on the snap, which means Burnham has a, a pretty natural snap count, gets out, and he should at least throw the ball away. He had time. He sees him right in front of him, but I guess he holds the ball because he doesn't want to fumble. But nice job by Benton. Nobody blocked him. The guard should have stepped to the right. He did not do it, and Benton did, makes a big play. So now Evans is going to watch his feet back there as he is basically just against the back of the end zone. Got rid of it. Yale's going to get great field position out of this as Tomich is backed up to midfield but has a chance for a little return. And that's exactly what it will be, a little return. As he's going to get taken down. Took three or four shots to do it, but Yale's going to start out at the Princeton 46-yard line with 7.25 left here in the third quarter. And an opportunity now for the Yale offensive unit. The defense of Yale, really, you should give them a, a hand because they did an outstanding job of keeping the Princeton offense at bay. They're giving the offense great field position, and that's what a good defense has to do. If the offense is struggling, the defense has got to come up and give them field position. They're, they're in Princeton territory. It's time to do something. Coach Shedlucky trying to get something out of his offensive unit. Scott, again, through the middle, ran right into Ferrara's arms and tried to push on through. Maybe a pickup of a couple of yards, but David Ferrara, the sophomore, was right there and knocked him back after the pickup of two. I want you to join Bruce Beck and talk sports with Sports Talk. Weekdays at 10, only on CN8, the Comcast Network. You've been a guest, haven't you? As a matter of fact, I know you have because I was there. That's when we met, Scott. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> then you did a good job. Oh, thanks. You made me look good. People said I was decent. <laughs> Tune in and see guys like Billy Taylor and, yeah, even me every once in a while. Second down and eight now. On play action, Wallen all kinds of time. Now a big open space as he tucks it away. It closed up pretty quickly as Ferrara got over there to cut him off, but a pickup of a couple of yards and third down now coming up. It was a nice job by Waylon. I thought that there was nobody open. He did a good job of tucking. The only thing I would say is he looked for his receiver. He only looked for it. He only stayed to his right. Nobody open. He tucks it and runs. Right here, I thought he should have kept his momentum going outside because he's got more speed than the linebacker, and I felt he could have picked up more yardage. Well, you saw Ferrara start to cut it off, and I agree with you. Had he stepped outside, he might have been able to outrun him. Instead, he cut it inside and went the safe route. He's definitely faster than David Ferrara. You would think. Third down at a long five. Got to get it to the 36. Fake blitz coming, but it's not coming. And Al Wallen, once again, all kinds of time, but he sailed it way over the head of his tight end, Bill Sprouse, who was pretty well covered by Jerry Wilson on the near sideline. And Princeton defensively has done a good job of taking that rollout away, taking his receivers away and making them have to do something else. I think they got to maybe roll to the other side and give them the option to run or pass. I thought for a moment there for a team that's not generating a lot of offense that going forward on fourth down at the Princeton 42 might not be a bad idea, but Coach Lucky has elected to play the field position game. And Haddonfield's own Mike Baracek gets a chance now to try to bury the other team. Once again, remember, he's one of the best in the nation at this as Ludwig waits. Baracek has put it inside the 20 15 times this year. Going to have to wait for this punt, however, as Princeton is called for a timeout. Now, I don't mean to harp on it, but people don't realize how meaningful special teams are. During the course of an 11-game college season, the special teams could probably win or lose two or three games. And that's why the punting, field goal kicking, and place kicking is so important during the course of a season. So now they will set it up. And once again, it's an art form trying to look for an angle. It's an art form, especially from here. You saw Ludwig with two big breakers already today on punts from that guy, Marache. Looking for number 16 on the year inside the 20. You know he's going to kick it away from the return man. The question is where? And it's a little pooch. He's going to try to get it to die inside the 10. Ludwig steps up, makes a nice play, and fair catching the ball at the 13-yard line. And that's where Princeton is going to start out. Next Saturday, live at 1.30, it's tradition-rich Ivy League football, and Cornell travels to... Franklin Field to meet the Penn Quakers. It's area college football only on CN8, the Comcast Network. That'll be our final NCAA regular season game of the year. And look at this, Harry McKelney has now come on as the quarterback for Princeton. I wonder why they made this move. 
We'll see what Akelney's got. Remember, he's been bothered by a rib problem, and the initial hand is going to result in a loss of yardage, maybe back to the line of scrimmage. And that's about all for Girado. The thing about it, you make a quarterback switch, and you think he's coming in for a reason, he comes in and has the ball on. Now, McKelly, as we said, was the Ivy League's leading passer a couple of years ago. He was not in school last year, came back this year for Steve Tashis and got off to a good start as Princeton actually got off to a good start. They were a four and one team before losing their last three straight. Second down and nine now. You would assume throwing situation for McKelly. Instead, it's going to be the pitch. Gerardo hit, fumbles the ball, and McKelly dives on top of it. Back at the six yard line, an alert play by McKelly averting potential disaster there for Princeton. As a matter of fact, when he first fumbled, I thought it was disaster. If you look at it, kind of fumbles the snap. The running back doesn't secure the ball. He's got his head up looking at the defender, and the running back should have had the ball. That could have been a big play, and that could have been the difference in the game right there. Well, you saw it. It came free. And Yale was diving to get on top of it. Isaiah Wilson just a step slow as McKelney had the angle for it. Third down and a bunch now. Third and 17 for Princeton. McKelney working out of the gun. Lots of time. Got a lane to throw it. It is complete. Out to the 20-yard line. Short of first down yardage as Ryan Crowley makes his first catch of the day. Still going to be about three yards shy of it. Now I see why McKelly is in there. That was an excellent pass. Gives him room for the punter to operate. And maybe they're going to start doing that. If they can do that, look at it. He sets up, throws the ball perfectly right on the nose in this cold weather. Puts the ball right where it should be. Roy Adams was there to make the stop. And I guess the fault there would be with Crowley for not running quite a deep enough pattern on that deep out to get first down yardage, but that was the only way he could come clear. End over end kick from Evans. Homich, once again, has a little bit of room. And straight through the middle again, Yale will be at the 47-yard line of Princeton, starting their second straight drive here in Tiger territory. Good look at Tomich as he comes off. Now I look to see what Dell can do. They have been unsuccessful running the ball up the middle, trying to open it up. Their rollout has been taken away also. If you need some cooking tips, we want you to check that. My apologies. I want you to tune in to Comcast Newsmakers It's Your Call with Lynn Doyle. It's weeknights at 6.30, only here on CN8, the Comcast Network. So now first down, the 47-yard line. Yale Drive beginning in Princeton Territory as we set for the second straight time. Not a whole lot of room and a coverage sack, I guess you could say, unless they were trying to sprint Wallet out to clear him to run one way or another. That play took a long time to develop. Yes, it did. I thought they were trying to sprint him out to give him the option to run or pass. He really had no option because the defenders had come across the line of scrimmage, gotten penetration, and forced him to have to tuck the ball. But that might have been an adjustment that Dale was trying to make would get outside to the right instead of going back to the left where they were unsuccessful. Ball would call the play in the huddle on a second down now. If you have been hungering for offensive action, this has not been your football game, but there's still some time to go. Ball out of the turn and hand to Scott. Good cutback as he got it down. Back down to the original line of scrimmage. Third down and long coming up as we take you down to the field to check in once again with Jason Barr. All right, thanks very much, Scott. I just want to tell you about that Princeton quarterback change. Harry Nickelny is coming off a sprained rib. He didn't practice all week, but he threw this morning, and apparently he felt okay. It's a coach's decision that he comes in right now and replaces Jackie Burnham. Back upstairs. Now Nickelny is going to be the guy that Princeton's going to try to ride a little bit now. Remember, as I told you, he had a good start to the season. Interception and touchdown ratio was not great, but he did move the team. Third down situation now for Yale. Third down and long. Blitz is coming. Wallen stepping up. He's got some room. He can get away, but Griff King made sure he couldn't after a gain of maybe a yard down to the 46. That Princeton defense must be reading his rollout. Whether he goes right or left, they got too much penetration on the defense. The offensive line is not getting the job done. When I talked to the Yale coaches before the game, he said his problem lies with the offensive line. He had no time to set up, no time to look for a receiver. Good job by the Princeton defense. Griff King so quick at stepping up and making sure that there was no way the quarterback was getting away. Now Morawczyk's in trouble, tried to kick it, and he did get it away. Partially blocked, I think, and look at this, he's still going to get it inside the 20. Heck, he's going to get it inside the 10, and it's rolling inside the 5. All the way down inside the 3-yard line to the 2. Well, he paid a heavy price, a stiff price, and he's a little bit shaken up, but he's going to take that baby because it put Princeton back down to their own 2-yard line. 
It's a weird game. Yes, it is. And I think he was very lucky because he just mishandled the ball, a lack of concentration. I don't know how he got the ball off. He got it off somehow, did an outstanding job. The defender had his head down. If he had, if he had his eyes up, he would have he would have been able to block, block the punt. Watch him. He had his head down. If he had been able to block the he had his head up, he would have been able to block the punt. But I guess sometimes you gotta be lucky in this game. Well, he got very lucky there with the bounce, and then as it rolled, it just continued to move. After the initial hit just inside the 20-yard line, that ball rolled nearly 18 yards down to the two. So on first down, there is your pitch. And McLaughlin checking back into the game. He saw some action in the first half, gets it out across the five. Scott, this is when the defense of the Yale Bulldogs can win the game. They got him basically inside inside the 10, if they can create a turnover or not allow them any further yardage, they can turn the ball over in good field position for the offense and possibly they can win this game. they still got a good chance. Even though the Yale offense has not got inside the red zone today, they still have a chance. Baracek making sure everything works properly. The Ivy League Rookie of the Week who just got barreled into on that punt attempt. Second down situation now for Princeton with a buck 24 left in the third. And once again it is McLaughlin breaking a couple of tackles and diving straight on out to the 8-yard line. Still going to need about four for the first down as we'll have third down coming up for the Tigers. And a lot of third downs here today, really, for both teams. Yes, it has been. But I think the defenses of both teams have played outstanding. The offenses have not been able to do things. And I think sometimes when it's cold weather like this, the offense is at the disadvantage because they have, they're more finesseful than the defense is. Following the block is he had the pulling guard, Abdullah, trying to show him the way. Third down situation now is McKelney brings his team up. You think either run or possibly short pass? I think he's got to run because he's too far down there if something happens. And he is going to run. McLaughlin's not going to get the first down. Got an initial hit at the line of scrimmage. Never got ahead of steam going. And once again, Princeton is going to have to punt from their own end zone. When you think about who's had good fortune all day, it's basically been Princeton. Nothing good has happened for Yale offensively. It's about time for them to create something on a special team, whether it's a punt return or a blocked punt. As you look at Governor Pataki again, he's a fan. He's a big fan. He's out there in the cold. Yeah. I like the hat. I do too. Yeah. He's styling with the hat. <laughs> he never wore that hat on letter to do it. No, he did. Twisting kick. And it's going to take a hit and a good roll for Princeton as he buys him a little bit of room. But how about three straight Yale drives that are now going to start in Princeton territory? This one, however, is going to have to start as the first play of the fourth quarter because that was the final play of the third. Three down and one to go. And the only thing we have seen so far on the scoring side is a 21-yard field goal from Alex Cirk. We told the special teams would play a part. So far, it has. Princeton goes to the fourth with a 3-0 lead. This telecast of Princeton University football is sponsored in part by McCaffrey's Supermarkets. McCaffrey's in the business of satisfying customers. In fact, McCaffrey's guarantees the highest quality in everything they offer. Market fresh fruits and vegetables, oven fresh baked breads, pastries, cakes, and gourmet prepared meals ready to eat and heat. McCaffrey's, a supermarket experience in Princeton, West Windsor, and Yardley, Pennsylvania. Help. No matter what the record this year, and for Yale, it's been tough at 1-7. and seven. The band generally is a very enthusiastic bunch at every school. I love college football because the excitement is overwhelming. People come out here in the cold weather, support their team. Look at that guy. He's having big-time fun. He doesn't look like he's cold. Doesn't even have gloves on. Now look at the game summary as we get set for the fourth quarter. Cirque, the 21-yard field goal. That's the only scoring we have had. Yale had an opportunity but missed from 43 yards away. Leach, second all-time at Princeton with his 17th career interception today, as we told you, trailing Superman, Dean Kane. The team has allowed the ball, the bat the ball backward. A lot of conference going on there after the last play of the third quarter about whether Princeton batted the ball backward as it was rolling to a stop. And after a very, very lengthy conversation, the officials decided that that was okay. <laughs> That's never a problem because it's just when the special teams are out there performing, sometimes you, ball, you have to bat the ball. Uh, backwards, it would, it would be better to do that than to go forward, I think. Now, very, very careful about the interpretation of the rules, but nonetheless, as we said, Yale has had some opportunities here in the second half. Trying to see what they can do against the Princeton defense that is anchored by that man, Tim Green, the co-captain of the team. 107 tackles last year. He was only the third junior to win the MVP award for the team in school history last year. This is his final... I guess you could say home game. You put that in quotation marks, but final home game for Princeton. 
giving him a lot of thrills. And this guy is tough. He is a very good player. He and Stanton are my two favorite players today. I'll tell you about Green, only 5'9", 2'10". He hits a lot bigger than that. Sam Mills. There you go. First down now from the 48-yard line as Yale goes for the third time in a row beginning in Princeton territory. A little bit of a rollout. Wallen has some time. There's the throw. Sailed it over the head of Jake Gordon. That's a good way to get your receiver dismembered down the field. I call that a hospital ball. Yep. That's when the ball is, you know, we talked about that before on your show. When yeah. the ball goes toward the defender <laughs> and the defender has a bead on the receiver, it's called a hospital ball. Because there's a bed at a local hospital waiting for the receiver who decides to stretch out to try to catch that. But Wayland gets a chance to set his feet, so that's why I'm surprised at that. But maybe the wind is a little bit higher. Yeah, he did kind of float that one, and it didn't look like he had a lot of control over it. Second down now from the 48-yard line. And the give straight through the middle. Down near the 46 yard line, maybe a pickup of a couple. Setting up a second down and eight. Make that a third down and eight. The Yale offense that time, the play before they tried to roll him, they tried to roll him to his right. That was different because they've been rolling to his left. Sometimes when a left-handed quarterback goes right, he, he, he feels awkward. That's maybe why the pass was overthrown. Uh, this is a key situation for him. The defense has been on the field third and long. They've got to figure out some way to do something new. As the coach is shaking his head, he's, he can, probably can't figure out anything himself. Yeah, that is a picture of a team at 1-7 and seven and struggling offensively. Wallen rolling to his good hand this time, rolling left, and incomplete. Marchner would have had to have made a circus catch on the sideline as that one sailed a little bit again. He was worried about keeping his feet down, but once he got to the ball, it was too late. But you can see the difference in Whalen when he rolls to his right and his left. He looked a lot more comfortable on that one. But then again, I think Princeton is getting aware of him going to his left side. So now Morocek again is going to come on to punt as Wallman gets some instruction when he comes off the field. A few moments ago, Morocek almost had one blocked. Another end-over-end -end kick, and Ludwig can field this one, and he will. From the 13-yard line, a little bit of a stumble, and a dive ahead out to the 19-yard line. That's where Princeton's going to start it out offensively. First and 10. We've got just under 14 minutes to go, and it's a battle of the punters, a battle of field position and a battle of special teams. A 3-0 lead for the Princeton Tigers. We'll be right back. Did you know that eating hot dogs can make a kid 46% less likely to use drugs? Be a mentor. Make a difference. With Harry McKelney back at the controls for Princeton, a first down from their own 19-yard line, and Akelney looking to throw on first down. Got the man, got Clifford, and Clifford with good yardage, stretching ahead to the 30-yard line for a first down on an 11-yard pickup. Nice pickup on first down, too. I've been a proponent of throwing the ball on first down because the defense is at the disadvantage. Nice job in Akelney for getting the ball off. That's probably why he's in the game, because now they're starting to throw the ball, and the win is going with him, so he has a chance to complete some passes. Mike Clifford, tough guy in the backfield, runs the ball well, catches it well. A senior out of Lansing, Illinois. On first down from the 30-yard line, three receivers to choose from again for Nikelli. This time he's going back to the ground. McLaughlin tries to break a tackle and does. Good gainer out across the 38-yard line. He got eight yards as that time Scott Benton appeared to be just a step slow to the tackle. And that left open the outside for McLaughlin to turn the corner. That was kind of a misdirection play. It kind of heads in toward the left and goes back to the right. Now what that does, it makes the linebacker step to the opposite side and lets the, the, the uh, offensive line get out in front. And then the linebacker, Scott Benton, wasn't able to get there because he stepped the wrong way reading the play in the beginning. A little bit more than eight yards on that first down run. So now on second down, the Kelly turns. And McLaughlin again, battering Ram through the middle. First down yardage. He didn't want to go down, but he finally did with a little assist from Eli Kelly. That's what happens when you gain good yards in first down because the, when, when you're second and shorter than six, it gives the, the offense the advantage. The defense doesn't know what you're doing. Nice call by Princeton. Kelly is sophomore out of Three Lakes, Wisconsin. And I guess if your name is Eli, you, you, you pick Yale because Yale's alternate nickname aside from the Bulldogs is the Yale Elis. I'm sorry, I just had to slip that in. 42-yard line, first down now for the Tigers. And once again, McLaughlin, he's turned into the workhorse back here in the second half. Gets it out across the 46-yard line near the 47. 
another five-yard pickup on first down. And that's another first down play that's more than four yards. Now your second down situation, the defense is at the disadvantage because they don't know whether you're going to run and pass. And this is the way to beat this Yale front seven because once they know what's going on, they are in trouble because they get penetration. Coach Sidlecki seeing it slip away as far as time goes. A team that's really hung around here today. McLaughlin off right side. First down yardage as he bangs into Yale territory at the Bulldog 47. And now Princeton comfortable to keep it on the ground. And this is where you were talking about it early, Billy. The fact that eventually you wear the defense down. And by the fourth quarter, when they're tired, you can kind of run over them. And I think what you're seeing by these missed tackles is fatigue setting in. They've been on the field all day. As you look at it, he's breaking tackles. They're on the, they're able to get arm tackles. They're reaching in for them. They're not coming off the blocks as quickly. And I think that is a result of being on the field much too long. Also, gang offensive line blocking. McLaughlin through the middle. And once again, a good offensive push gets him down near the 40-yard line. Every play is six yards or better, it appears, when they're running the football. And they're just overloading the blocking, sliding out either a guard or a guard and tackle to help escort the running back. And McLaughlin is running very good. Now, when a running back gets tired, that's when he's at his best because he's only going by his own reaction. Nice job by, by calling him to run the ball. They should continue. Coaches are creatures of habit. Well, in this case, the habit is a good habit because Princeton is putting together their first sustained drive of the second half. On second down. McKelney out the control. A little busted play it looked like and Clifford still managed to spin his way down near the stick. I believe he just got himself a first down inside the 37 yard line. This offensive line of the Princeton offense, we're talking about Bennett, Abdullah, uh, Wilson, Herdman, all of them are beginning to take control of the line of scrimmage. When this happens, the game is virtually over because they're gaining confidence, the running backs are gaining confidence, and the defense is off the field. They are going to measure, but I believe that is first down yardage. We'll see whether or not when they stretch the sticks out as Clifford kind of spun his way toward the marker, and it is indeed a Princeton first down. And if you look at the Yale defenders, they're putting their hands on their hips. That's the first sign of fatigue. He's breaking tackles. Clifford's doing a good job of, of giving extra effort. And this is what football is all about, is when the offensive line begins to take control. Now Steve Tosh's team now, once again, is starting to move things offensively. They did it a couple of times in the first half. A big, big turnover deep in Yale territory turned off one drive. And now McLaughlin, again, now with his ninth carry in the last 10 plays, gets it down to the 32. And that's when a running back is at its best. When he starts to get into his groove, feeling the, kind of like that he's in that zone. He sees big holes, he's able to run through. And the biggest McLaughlin is, all he has to do is lean forward and he gets positive yardage. Excellent. Look at this offensive line begin to take control. He's coming through holes that maybe I could make him come back on, Scott. Now Mike Clifford helped out there as well, shutting off Todd Scott as the fullback led the way for the hole. Another one of those five-yard pickups on first down. Second down now to Kelly, has barely had to put it up, and it's just McLaughlin left, McLaughlin right. He gets this one down after a pickup of about two yards to the 30-yard line, and a rarity for Princeton on this drive. They're going to look at third down. And the thing about this drive, though, you may talk about McLaughlin's got the ball nine out of ten times or whatever, and you might think he's wearing him out, but that is not true. In the weather like this, he's not getting tired because he's not sweating very much, and he's probably getting stronger as he goes along. I see the offensive line taking charge. They are beginning to gain some confidence, and that look at this drive. This had the ball at least four or five minutes already. I believe it has been about four and a half minutes right now here on third down play action. And Kelly's got it set up. Up over the top for Windler. End zone touchdown. Oh, you run it, you run it, you run it, and you set up play action. Wendler came free at the goal line. His first touchdown catch of the year, and Princeton is now up 9-0 outstanding job by the entire offense. They had been controlling the line scrimmage. The linebackers were creeping up for Yale, the Yale Bulldogs. Finally got down 30 short. They have a play action pass to the running back, fake it to, to McLaughlin, and, and let Waylon uh, get away from the defender. Had time to even make a 360 and catch the ball. Nice call by uh, Princeton Bulldogs. And that was really one receiver. There was only one receiver down the field for the Tigers on that play. It was Wendler. It was all or nothing for Harry Nikelny going up on the top. Excuse me, the Princeton Tigers. I called them the Bulldogs. Sirk now on to attempt the extra point. He's been perfect in this capacity this year. He hasn't missed much of anything. Bad snap and all, and that one he missed. No sooner did I say it than it happened. That was not Sirk's fault, but it was a tough snap and a little bit of a juggle made by the holder. 
And so now the score remains at 9 nothing instead of 10 nothing. But one way or another, it's still now a two-score game. Yale's got to score twice. One of them has to be a touchdown in order to come back into this one. I think that drive virtually makes it impossible for Yale to come back because they wore the defense out. It took them to live for the field. Now Yale has to score two times, which they haven't done all game. So that was a great drive by Nikelda. As you look at the replay, watch the fake to the running back. Seals everybody inside. He's able to get, let Wilner get one-on-one -on -one with, with the defensive back. He's able to make a U-turn. Make a 360, catch the ball, and touchdown. Look at the, look at how this everybody sucks up on the on the Yale defense. That's exactly what play action passing is all about. And is able to let the, the, the receiver get back behind the defensive back, touchdown. Great drive by the Princeton Bulldogs. Their best drive all day. Now you said Wendler had time to even do a 360 in the end zone to come back to the ball, and he had a good couple of steps on Todd Tomich, and no help at all back there behind him. Wendler caps off an 81-yard drive, 10 plays, and one that took. More than four minutes off the clock. So it leaves Yale with just 9.07 to work with. Had a lot of trouble back down there. And Tomich is going to have to return this from his own two-yard line. And he's going to get buried at the six. Special teams are a vital part of the game. They can either win or lose the game. On that play, they nail them inside the 10-yard line. They have to go 90-some yards. And it's a tough time with 8.55 left in the game. Now they are in a lot of trouble right now, and you don't want to be Joe Wallen coming out after struggling the way you have, knowing that you've got to throw the ball to get two scores with under nine minutes left, and buried back at your own six-yard line. I guess here is where you just kind of let it all hang out and just throw where you can. It's hard now because you're inside the 10 to have to put the ball up because any type of interception is negative. On first down, linebackers poised to blitz. They're not going to have to as you got a run coming and a run stuck back for a loss of a yard. R.C. Kaufman had nowhere to go once he got the hand. I'm looking at the defense of the Yale Bulldogs who are on for that 81-yard drive. They are on the bench. Their tongues are hanging out. They are tired. They're hoping the offense gets at least one first down before they got to go back out there. Well, they won't if Tim Green has anything to say about it. As you look at the play, Kaufman trying to get past Green, and Green just straight on through that gap. He does a great job of filling those gaps. Tim Green is a very tough one. So now a second down. Time running with 8.18 left. And once again, it is going to be R.C. Kaufman. This time a little bit more positive yardage game as he gets it out near the 10-yard line and was taken down on the play by Ferrara. And see, Scott, this defense of Princeton is coming in well-rested. They've been on the pitch the last five or six minutes. The offense goes out and scores. That makes them come in with momentum, with hungriness, and they're ready to shut down this yellow offense and let the offense come back on the field. You saw an interesting play call from the sideline as Jackson Leckie held up 5-6. Then what Wallen has to do is look down on the wristband for play number 5-6. He rolls out, and this is what 5-6 is. No one's open. And he's got to throw it away. Everybody crowded over to that side of the field, and as you talked about it, Princeton anticipating that. That's exactly right. And they have made an adjustment that when he rolls to his right or left, they try to get everybody in that zone where no one is, is, is open. So it's a tough situation for Whale and the quarterback. And three downs is out is exactly what the defense of Whale, of, of the Yale Bulldogs, did not need. Baracek now is going to punt it away for the tenth time today. Came into the game with 57 total for the year. This is number 10 today. Ludwig going to have great field position. He fumbled the football. He muffed it. It's still on the ground, and Yale's got it. Mazza came down with the football. It bounced right into his bread basket, and a break for Yale as Ludwig could not handle it cleanly. And then after it seemed like he put it away, he fumbled it again. Special teams again, because they have been a big difference in the game. This is what Yale needs at this time of the game. This could be a momentum uh, situation that takes it away from what Princeton has done offensively. I can't get a better bounce than that if you're Mazza. And it looked as though Ludwig might have lost it in the lights as it came through the lights here. Watch. But then once he got the handle, he should have tucked it away a little bit harder. But then I guess he never got the handle again. And Mazza was right there to fall on it. So a little bit of a break for Yale as they stay alive with 7.18 to go. Second Princeton turnover. First one prevented them from scoring deep in Yale territory. That one may have left the window open for Yale, but they close it right away on defense as Whaling and Griff King meet at the quarterback. This is what the defensive players love. When an offense has to pass the ball, they can lay their ears back and come at the quarterback. They have nothing to lose. The play action is not going to hold them. The running game is not going to hold them. They 
can just tee off on a quarterback. The play action means nothing, and Griff comes off the corner, and they meet at the quarterback. Outstanding job by putting pressure on the quarterback. Griff King and Mark Welling. Ferrara was also in the vicinity as well. And a five-yard loss on first down. This makes it tough for the Yale Bulldogs. This whole game has been tough for Yale. <laughs> Actually, this whole season has. About to go to 0-6 in the Ivy League if they drop this decision today. And just before the delay of game ball, Joe Wallen calls for a timeout. 6.33 to go here at Giants Stadium. And Princeton right now sitting on top of a 9-0 lead. Looking for the victory. This telecast of Princeton University football is sponsored in part by McCaffrey's Supermarkets. McCaffrey's does catering. For the best the season has to offer, whatever the occasion, McCaffrey's has the answer. Tailgate parties, casual events, or formal affairs. You can count on McCaffrey's to make it easier on you. McCaffrey's, a supermarket experience in Princeton, West Windsor, and Yardley, Pennsylvania. And there you take a look on the bench at the Yale defense. They have been overworked all day today, and they're hoping they don't have to come back anytime soon as Joe Wallen leads the Yale offense, trying to put together a sustained drive with a second down and long coming up. As the band plays, I want to do something I don't normally do. I want to send out birthday wishes today to my grandfather, High Green, 90 years old today. I know he's watching. I know he's enjoying. Happy birthday, Grant. Second down now from the 36-yard line. And the man in motion is R.C. Kaufman. A lot of time to throw for Wallen. Trying to get away from Griff King and the speed of Griff King makes sure he can. We've talked about that a few times today. King is 6'7", 260, but he can move. And he got Wallen from behind, making sure he didn't get away. They tried to put R.C. Kaufman in motion to flood the zone. But then they had too many receivers in one area. The quarterback gets a little confused. He's got to do nothing but eat the ball. He was trying to get over to that sideline, but he waited just a little bit too long. And the tallest player ever to suit up for Steve Tosh is at 6'7". Comes up with another big hit. You know, you put another 20 or 30 pounds on Griff King, he's pro material. Tell you what, his senior season, he has been a stellar part of a really strong Princeton defensive front four. It's coming from the corner on third down and an incomplete pass. The receiver never had a prayer. They were trying to get it to Sapilnikov, but he was knocked down at the line of scrimmage and with the blitz coming from that corner, the ball falls incomplete. And David Ferraro, number 95, was able to come from the backside and, and Waylon, uh, he, uh, Joe Wallen, excuse me, he got to, he felt the pressure from the backside, which is a net for a quarterback. He wasn't able to set and throw. Well, showcase day for Mike Barachek out of Haddonfield. Probably has family watching on Garden State Cable. <laughs> His leg may be tired. I'll tell you what. Good kick directionally got it away from Ludwig. And that hit like a sand wedge went out at the 24-yard line. I'll tell you what. He's, he's, he's going to be sleeping on that bus back to New Haven. I have never seen a punter. I think Dave Jennings, my first or second with the Giants, he probably punted about 15 times in one game. Oh, yeah, I remember you that. remember those days? Yeah, I remember those days. I wasn't going to bring them up, but I do remember <laughs> those days. I think he led the NFL in punting that year. Giant fans always kept saying that Dave Jennings was their biggest weapon. <laughs> Once again, let's take a look. You, you put in a big, long day. You get a good kickoff. A little satisfaction. You see that that ball is going to stop for you pretty nicely. Come on, let's get out of bounds. Let's go. As Clifford takes the hand, and Princeton's looking to kill clock now with 5.20 left to go. It's a matter of, of really Princeton running the ball out. Now, when the offensive line knows that they have the advantage over the defensive line, they just come right at them, and that's exactly what Princeton, the entire offensive line, is doing right now. We saw the Tigers earlier this year here on CNA in their other, in quotes, home game at the College of New Jersey. They put up nine points in that one as well and beat Fordham by a 9-7 to seven score. Today, they've been pitching the shutout for Steve Toshis. And if they can run out the clock, they'll finish with a shutout. McLaughlin who was the workhorse back on the big drive at seven carries for 36 yards. He gets it out to the 29-yard line. And what the Yale Bulldogs have to do defensively, they got to look for a turnover. When they're making tackles, the second guy in has got to try to go for the ball because they need to create something. But then when they do create it, the offense is not doing anything with it, so maybe they need someone to pick up a fumble and run it back. This Princeton team has not thrown a shutout all year. They have been shut out, however. So is Yale, as you can imagine, with the offensive problems they've had. They lost to UConn in their second game, 28 to nothing. 
On third down to Kelly, a little bit of a roll. Linebacker blitz cover, the throw complete. Nice catch made by Crowley. He stays in bounds and slides underneath it at the 41-yard line. Big play catch from Ryan Crowley. I thought it was an excellent pass by Harry McKelney. He did a good job of rolling out, putting the ball in the money with pressure. And then Crowley comes in, gets it in, slides, makes the catch. First down, uh, uh, Princeton. Nice job by Princeton because everybody thought they were going to throw the ball, put the ball on the money. Nice job. I guess this guy's showing you why he came in the game. And since he came in the game, the offense has picked up. Much the same way last week at Penn when Akelney went out and Burnham came in. The offense turned around. You see that happen from time to time when the backup comes in. They, everybody kind of takes notice and steps up their play a little bit. Pounding through the middle is McLaughlin again as he gets it out to the 44-yard line and a pickup of a couple of yards. Second down coming up with the clock running and 3.40 left. This is hard for Yale Bulldogs because they know what they have to do, but then the Princeton team is running the ball. The linebackers for Yale is creeping up even further, and so even if it gets, even if Clinton or Clifford get beyond the line of scrimmage, the linebackers are too close up in there. If this was up, and there was, if there was less than, if there was more time than this, they'd be able to throw the ball and get something behind the linebackers, but there's no need right now. Yale dig it in. They haven't played with a whole lot of quick today, and they did scramble to keep this one close. McKelney's hand to McLaughlin again, right side, out to the 48-yard line, third down coming up. Yale's next game and their final game of the year is going to be at Yale Bowl next weekend in the one they call the game, the oldest rivalry, the game against Harvard. And with our scores that we heard earlier today from Cambridge as Harvard was just pounding Penn, that's likely to be a coronation ceremony for the Harvard Crimson next week as they go into Yale and try to walk away with the Ivy League title. But you know, if Yale goes up there and wins the game, that could make their season. Anytime, no matter what the season is, if you beat Harvard, it's kind of like the Army-Navy thing. Just make sure you understand, and then we'll get up on the ball. Coach it all the way to the end. And a timeout call for by Princeton with 2.29 left. You got to take your hat off to both defenses. They played very well. They played hard today. They played with aggressiveness. And really, it's a shame that Yale didn't mount any type of offensive threat to help their own defense out. McKelney was hurt and was not the starter today with the rib injury. However, four for four since coming on, 67 yards, including a 30-yard touchdown pass to Phil Wendler that more or less put Princeton up over the top and put this game out of reach. And you can almost bet that the Kelney will be the starter next week because of this performance here in the second half. Next week for Princeton is a game at Dartmouth. They're going to break their three-game losing streak today. It's been a streaky season. Tigers won their first, make that loss their first game at Cornell. Then four wins in a row, followed by three losses leading up to today. If you need some cooking tips, let the chef Paul Dillon show you the way on Let's Cook. Weekdays at 10.30 and again at 5, only here on CNA, the Comcast Network. So now a third down, and this will determine really whether Yale is going to get the ball back with any time left on the clock to try anything. McLaughlin sweeping, and he's not going to get the first down. Good job once again by Scott Benton, who made penetration and made sure that there was nowhere for McLaughlin to go he came in down low and turned him inside. Again, my hat's off to the Yale Bulldogs because they could have even easily given up defensively because they had no help on offense. As you look at Scott Benton, he reads the play, gets in the hole quickly, squares it up, hits, gets able to get the legs out from McLaughlin and, and prevents him from getting the first down. Princeton's letting some time run, and I wonder whether or not they're just going to let it all run out. Surely you jest. And they are going to let the time run down and probably either take the time out or the penalty. And they are going to take the penalty and back themselves up five yards. Let the clock run down as much as they could to 143 left in the game. And that's playing by the book. Gives your punter a little bit better opportunity and it makes sure that Yale has less time. But I don't know that we've seen yet today that Yale is really a big time threat to be able to have any quick strike capability. They've hit a couple of big plays but a couple is all. And the adjustments that Princeton made on the rollouts was to flood the zone on both sides. So anytime that Whalen is able to get outside, he cannot find anybody, so they got to go back to the drawing board. Maybe he should throw down the middle. One time they did complete one down the middle on a post or a seam pattern. Evans took a high snap and did a good job just to get rid of it. And out Tomich, up across the 20, fumbled the football. Was he down? Are they going to call it on contact, or does Princeton come up with the ball? And I believe they're going to call it down by contact. You got to almost feel sorry for him in that because there were too many defenders around. He had no blocking. That's dangerous. 
as you look at the replay, listen to the sound of this. Oh, wow. I felt that Scott again. <laughs> Especially on a cold day. He may feel that until next week. Special teamers, my heart goes out to you. I hate special teams, but I know <laughs> how valuable they are. First down for Yale now. Best scoring opportunity of the day came on a missed 43-yard field goal. There was actually a penalty on the play as well. And now that basically works as a lateral, not as a pass. One way or another, it's not going to work for anything. It's going to get stopped back at the 18-yard line for a three-yard loss. Nothing there for Yale as they tried to swing the pass out to Chris Torito. And the thing about Princeton's defense is they're coming in well-rested. Now they're into the hurry-up offense for Yale. Now just a little bit more than a minute left to go. And Joe Wallen calling out the play at the line of scrimmage. Back to throw again. Got the receiver, and it's complete. Nice catch. And Marshner held on at the 29-yard line. I thought he should have been doing that earlier because the outside patterns were not working. I thought it was better if you throw inside. Had a timeout called for by Yale. They still do have one timeout left in 51 seconds. They want to get on the board. They don't want to get shut out here. And this is a chance to try to work and build up some confidence going into next week. Yes, it is, because still, even though you're working on stuff, you have still have another game. I thought it was outstanding that he went inside. It was a little late. The thing about it, Scott, is before the game, the coach of uh, Yale was telling me that his defensive front seven, he's got great confidence, but he doesn't have confidence in the defensive backs. And his offense is pretty inept, and he was pretty correct today about that. Now, what he's trying to do is instill some confidence in Joe Wally, who's only a sophomore, a good athlete, as we told you about. He was a wide receiver for this team. He was a special teamer for this team, and now has stepped in as the quarterback. I invite you to join host Mick Moninghoff for the area's hottest high school sports magazine show. It's called Scholastic Sports Weekly, Wednesday night at 7.30, holding on CN8, the Comcast Network. Now it's going to be a long road back, but all, also been told by some observers that Coach Sidlecki was not really left with a whole lot when Carm Koza left, and it's really a matter of building it back up again. So Yale has been held to 23 yards of total offense here in the second half. Trying to take one more shot at it up top, and that ball is overthrown. Once again, the intended receiver on the play was Chris Torito. 46 seconds left. You got to take your head off to Wallen because he's stood in there tough in the pocket. He hasn't had many things to really do. His, his receivers haven't gotten open. He hasn't been able to read anything that's positive, and he's still playing hard. Fourth down, they've obviously got to go for it. Coach Todd, Coach Tashis now guarantees himself at least a 500 season, and they go for the winning season next week up in Hanover, New Hampshire. One more try at it now. It would appear for the Yale offense. We'll see with 46 seconds to go as Wallen sets him up. Not an artistic game by any stretch of the imagination. The Princeton will take it. Wallen's throw complete, and the drive will continue as Marshner skips out of bounds at the 39-yard line. And Princeton is basically dropping everybody at back and making Wallen try to throw underneath. And he's doing a good job of moving it, but what it's doing is just keeping the clock moving and, and really allowing them to run the game out. And once again, reading the play from the wristband. These are the times that you try to make a quarterback, you try to make a guy confident. So next week, next year, remember, he's just a sophomore. He gets another chance to do it again. Tough kid, too. And he's got to be taking hits like that. Tim Green and Jamie Toddings, the linebackers, both coming on a blitz, dropping back at the 36. And the last time out called for by Yale, they really would like to get on the board. It's always something when the linebacker is able to time the snap at the line of scrimmage and get there just in time. Look at Tim Green as he comes just as the ball is snapped. The running back doesn't have time to set up and block him, and that's what you call a sack. I told you, Wallet is a tough guy. Yes, he is. And he can take these kind of hits and, and kind of bounce back from them. As a guy who's only 195 pounds, he bench presses 280 and can squat 355. So he's, yeah, he's got a little bit of bulk, but he's got some leverage, too. When you're 5'9", like Sam Mills, you are able to get under the defender, and that's the difference. I don't care how big you are, if, the, if the, the guy who's trying to make the tackle gets lower than you, he will have leverage. I don't care if the guy is 250 and you're 190, you can get under him. A little bit of juggling going on in that shot for the Princeton band. 
known for their mirth. They've had fun. They don't look cold at all. Some of their faces look a little red from the from the wind, but they look like they're having a good time. I'll tell you what, they would love to call this Meadowlands area home forever because they got themselves a football win, breaking the three-game losing streak here today. And earlier this week, in two games played over across the street at the Continental Airlines Arena, in the Coaches versus Cancer Tournament, they beat Texas and North Carolina State to start their season out 2-0 in basketball. Wallet, it was 8 for 21 on the day. 32 seconds left. Totting's coming on the blitz. And there is going, it's going to lead to a sack. I'm not sure that Totting's is going to get any credit for forcing that sack. But it does lead to the sack as Totting's came on a big time blitz from the outside. The thing about when you blitz like they're doing, the, the, the receivers are in man coverage, but he doesn't have time to get to them. Third down now. Nine seconds and cutting left. This should be the last play of the game. Wallen with time. And the throw incomplete. And that will be the final play of the game. Well, the Princeton defense pitches its first shutout of the year. Lots of cause for celebration as the three-game losing streak is over. And the Tigers guarantee themselves at least a 500 season with a chance for a winning season next week. One field goal, one touchdown was the only margin here as Princeton knocks off Yale today by a final score of 9 to nothing. And the Yale Bulldogs fall to 1-8 and eight overall. Steve Tosh's team now at 5-4. and four. We'll be back with our post-game wrap-up as we take a look back at this Princeton victory in just a moment. Tigers win it by 9. If you smoke pot one time, it probably won't kill you. But if you keep smoking it, you might just get dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber. dumber. Wow. Nine nothing Princeton win here at the Meadowlands. Let's take you down to the field to Jason Barr standing by with the winning coach. All right, that's right, Scott. Thanks. Uh, here's Steve Tosh's Princeton winning coach. It wasn't the prettiest game, but your defense kind of shut them down for you most of the way. Yeah, where we are right now in our season, we'll, we'll take any kind of win. We don't need to get, get into whether it's a, a stylist or not. Um, our defense, hey, listen, the defense has been the heart and soul of this football team. The guy next to you, he's been the heart and soul of that defense all year long. Uh, yeah, you win as a team, you lose as a team, but that defense was phenomenal today. All right, then I got to go. Thanks for a minute. And now uh, Tim Green. Big part of that defense, as your coach just mentioned, he had a big sack we're going to take a look at it right now. Talk a little bit about what you guys accomplished today. Uh, you know, I, I told the guys before the game, you know, it, it's such a special day for us, you know, playing in Giants Stadium, you know. And, and I think, you know, this is the closest any of us will ever get to a pro-type football game, you know, and the atmosphere today was just great. You know, I told the guys, you know, just take heed, you know, seize the moment today because it's a very important game. All right, we'll talk about Giants Stadium in a second. You had some big sacks. Talk about the defensive line and how you're able to penetrate. Uh, I, all day they did a great job. I mean, you know, they had no time to throw the ball. We were penetrating gaps. You know, they, you know, I think they, they were the key to our, our win today. You know, they kept pressuring the quarterback all day long. They did, I can't say enough about the job they did. And now getting back to uh, Giants Stadium, how big a thrill is that for somebody in New Jersey to play here and win and shut the opposing offense out? It, it, it's amazing. I, I can't, you know, I can't describe the feeling right now. It's probably one of the greatest feelings of my life, you know, just playing in a stadium like this, the atmosphere like this. You know, like I said, it's probably close we'll ever get to a pro game, you know, and that atmosphere today was great. Now, I mean, it was nothing but fun for us. Yeah, it's had a pretty, uh, both clubs had a pretty big turnout here, especially yeah. considering the cold weather. Right. Yeah, I, I, was, I, I was just glad, you know, the rain held off, you know, and the fans really vocal. It was just a great time. All right, Tim Green, thanks so much. Princeton wins at 9 nothing. Back upstairs. Well, it was a day for the Princeton defense today, but also for the offense. And Harry Nakelly, who came on in the second half, came up with a big throw. I thought the play action he did to McLaughlin was outstanding. Philip Windler did a good job of having to throw a 3-6 and catch the ball. Big touchdown. That's the one that iced the game. That made it a 9 nothing game, and 9 nothing turned out to be the final score as Princeton did go up top, did get its touchdown, and ultimately did walk out of here with its victory. Now, for Yale, the road has been tough all year long. For Princeton, though, they come up with a victory here, and once again, they, you know, they settle a quarterback situation as Harry Nakelny comes on, and he did look good. I thought as soon as he came in, the offense picked it up. The offensive line began to take charge, and I think his passes were pinpoint, and he was able to at least control things. McLaughlin began to run good, and when he was able to pass, he was able to put the ball in the money. He's the starting quarterback.
Well, this is a Princeton team that gets the victory and then moves on to Dartmouth to end things up for the year as Harry DeKelney meets the fans here at Giant Stadium. A little bit of a larger wall and a little bit more of a look than you have to make normally when you're at Princeton or anywhere else. Of course, they haven't played at Princeton this year. Next week, we do have another Ivy League battle for you. Now, Penn is set to take on Cornell. More Ivy League rivalry that is coming up here on CNA, the Comcast Network. That'll be live next Saturday at 1.30 at Franklin Field. Penn thought they might be playing for the Ivy League title. They got blown out today up at Harvard. That would have been a good game for next week because it was set up really nice to end the season. But I thought maybe even though the end of the season is coming, maybe the players are wanting it because it's too cold. Well, you also got Penn and Cornell. And in the past, this has been a bitter rivalry. They have been very exciting games, very unpredictable games. Not unlike the Penn-Princeton rivalry that we brought to you last week here on CNA. Billy Taylor, it was a pleasure to work with you. It was my pleasure, Scott. You're a good guy, buddy. Thanks to Billy Taylor and to our entire CNA Comcast Network crew. Princeton, a 9-0 winner. This is Scott Graham. Thanks for watching.